Hi, I'm Tom Hughes and welcome to Improvement Starts With I. The book is available here on YouTube and on improvementstartswithi.com in various formats at no charge. You can also get a hard copy of the book anywhere in the world by ordering on Amazon. Our target is simple. It's to change as many lives as possible by helping as many organizations as possible build extraordinary lean cultures. It would be great if you could help our mission by helping as many people as you can know about Improvement Starts With I. So I hope you enjoy the book and many thanks for your support. Welcome to Improvement Starts With I, written and read by Tom Hughes. The Foreword Hi, my name is Tom Hughes and I wrote this book to help people understand what lies at the heart of any great lean transformation. My objective is to provide a prescriptive step-by-step -step manual that solves the problem of people and organizations that want to get started on that journey but simply don't know how. So let's start with the big fundamental question. What exactly is lean? This might seem like a very obvious question, but I'm asking it because more than 98% of people who think they have the answer get it wrong. I say that because while there are certainly hundreds of companies around the world that successfully do lean, there are thousands more who completely miss the point. They have tried and failed, or even worse, fool themselves into believing that they are authentic lean companies, when in fact what they really have are limp, boring, and wholly uninspiring cultures. If the atmosphere is like that, then it just is not lean. So I've written this book to help you avoid the potholes that so many companies have fallen into. I feel qualified to write this book because I have decades of experience of transformational change within organizations all over the world. Initially not using lean as the vehicle, but just making change happen the old-fashioned way with a huge amount of effort and a lot of mistakes. We managed to get some great results, but there was also a lot of collateral damage along the way that tends to accompany such an approach. Today, I have developed an understanding that makes me see Lean as the best vehicle to take your company wherever you want it to go. However, I did not always look at Lean this way because I shared the same basic misunderstanding that 98% of people have. Let me explain. The opening decade of my career was spent in the automotive supply chain, working directly with Toyota, Nissan and Honda, among other car manufacturers practicing these advanced manufacturing techniques every day. It wasn't even called Lean back then. I'm showing my age. It was just the Toyota production system, or doing things the Japanese way. I worked at some huge first-tier automotive suppliers. My first job was with Rockwell Automotive, a spell in Tier 2 plastics at a 100-people firm, then back in Tier 1 working in Germany with BTR Automotive. I worked directly with the source. As most people would agree that modern lean originates from Toyota, so you'd certainly be forgiving for thinking that I really should have known what lean is. After automotive, I worked for the French multinational Alstom as a sourcing engineering director for a $400 million division before doing an MBA and spending 10 years transforming the legendary hydraulic manufacturer Olaire in France and around the world. Five years in supply chain and five years as commercial director. We took that business to $200 million before exiting to Parker Hannafin. During this non-automotive spell, I still applied the lean tools and techniques in those businesses. It was a big part of my value added. When you look at all that, most people would say I'd done some pretty big stuff and that I really had no excuse not to know what lean is. The truth is, though, 
that in spite of all my experience working with Japanese car manufacturers and all that international high-level experience that I did not. Until a few years ago, my view of lean would have simply been the textbook answer most people practicing lean would give. Lean is the elimination of waste through continuous improvement. <laughs> Sounds exciting, doesn't it? My personal view used to be that lean was an extremely useful set of tools. It was super effective, but as we would say in Ireland, not much crack. As in, not much fun. The misunderstanding that I had was very common. Lean is done to people rather than with them. The fundamental problem is that most people view lean as being primarily about process improvement, when in fact this is not true. Process improvement is just one of the byproducts. When I came on board to spearhead a company transformation in Northern Ireland, where I currently live, I started to correct the error in my thinking. I thought I was joining this company's team to make a strategic shift to find new markets for their manufacturing technology. Their traditional product market was in sharp decline, so I thought the number one priority would be to win new customers in new segments. Instead, on day one, the company directors presented me with their top priority. I'll never forget it. Here I was at my new desk and the two sisters who were the company's main owners came up to me and said, we want you to implement Lean. When I present this story to an audience, I use a picture of Edward Munch's famous painting, The Scream, accompanied by the loud noise of someone screaming painfully, as if from some slasher horror movie. This sums up my reaction. I was horrified. I hadn't held a shop floor based manufacturing role in over 10 years, and I thought I was way past doing lean. I was much too senior for that. After getting over my initial shock, my next reaction was where is my team? Traditionally, I would have needed at least one person to help collate the key performance measures facilitate the Kaizen workshops, carry out the 5S training and audits, and more. I knew these guys didn't have the budget for that, so I thought I would reach out to a local government agency, Invest Northern Ireland, as they might be able to provide some funding support, which would at least help me gather the resources I felt necessary to get this thing moving. So, a couple of weeks later, these guys turned up. They were nice people, initially offering advice about how we could make efficiency improvements and better manage our inventory. I was still not very excited. Then one of the guys, Jeff Crawford, came out with the now immortal line of, there's this company in Limavati. They were world class at lean, he maintained, a bit like a cult, doing stretches together every morning, much as the Japanese do and with extremely high energy, albeit a bit weird. He showed me a YouTube video of this guy called Paul Akers touring their facility. Visually, it blew me away. It really did. But the sheer energy I witnessed that day blew me away even more. Here's a clip of that video just to give you a flavor. Hi everyone, I want to take you on an amazing lean journey to Northern Ireland to a company called CD Matters. It has about 50 or 60 employees and they're changing the world of healthcare seating. Now this is a family run company, three brothers started it and they're absolutely incredible. They asked me to come there to speak to them and inspire their organization but the truth of the matter is they inspired me and hopefully this will inspire you. I'm at CD Matters and you are going to see the most incredible tour you've ever seen in your life. Buckle up because they make awesome chairs that are going to help your elderly parents and your loved ones. Let's go. I refer to lots of videos in the book. Sometimes we will have a clip here, but most of the time the links are contained in the video description or in the resources section of the Lean Play app. 
There is an icon for the resources at the bottom right hand corner of the play screen in the app. Sometimes those links take you to a website, but most of the time it's to a YouTube video that's referred to here. If a picture says a thousand words, a video says a million. So I really recommend that you check them out as you come across them. They add immeasurably to the improvement starts with I experience. Anyhow, back to the story. I was fortunate enough that Jeff gave me the number of Ryan Tierney, one of the directors at Seating Matters, who was beyond helpful when I reached out to him on WhatsApp. Ryan said, I needed to read a book called Two Second Lean, written by Paul Akers, the guy in the YouTube video. He also told me that Paul himself was very open and easy to communicate with. He recommended I reach out to him. I thought this was highly unusual. This guy is a famous author and I can just drop him a WhatsApp message and he'll get back to me? It seemed a peculiar prospect. Anyhow, I didn't do that at first. To begin with, I downloaded the audiobook on Audible and listened to it on my way home that night. I had a one and a half hour commute, so by the time I got home the following evening, I'd listened to the whole thing as the book is less than four and a half hours long. I will give myself credit for once. I got a lot of the book's thrust during that first listen. I listened to it more than a dozen times since, and I liken it to good scripture. Each time you visit it, you get something new at another level. The revelation for me was this. Instead of me and maybe a right-hand champion of lean type person, along with a few select others in the organization, doing lean? Two Second Lean was a completely different approach. It is a simple structure of having a morning meeting every day for the whole company, where everyone learns to see waste, and then have time to 3S, sweep, sort, and standardize, and make improvements, applying the learning to their work. Not some group of smart and elite leaders trying to push the lean train. The entire organization does lean. So much easier than the traditional sporadic approach that was nigh on impossible to sustain. To do this every day? Obvious. At least to me. The other great news for me personally was that this whole approach really fitted well with my skill set and what I like to do professionally. I love leadership. I've always loved working with my team, challenging them, supporting them, and ultimately watching them grow. It's one of my all-time favorite career things to do. That's fundamentally what real lean is all about. So instead of being some dry, boring process full of analytics and graphs, sporadic workshops and consultants, this was all about leadership and engagement at all levels within the organization. I was loving this already and getting excited. A few weeks after encountering the Two Second Lean book, I visited Seating Matters for the first time to have a lean tour. After their amazing morning meeting, I spoke to Ryan, and like the good accomplished corporate seagull I'd often been up until that point, I asked him, Hey Ryan, what are your KPIs? Key performance indicators. He looked at me strangely and said, oh, We don't worry about that. We just focus on growing and developing our people and we find that the rest just comes. Luckily, this exchange was caught on video and the look on my face is hilarious. It was the look of a penny dropping. Check that video out. It's awesome. I learned so much during that day with Ryan and the rest of their outstanding team. Ryan explained to me that to begin with, they had wasted 18 months of hard work before even he realized that Two Second Lean was all about building culture. Like so much in the lean community, that learning occurred when he visited another world-class lean company in Germany, Michael Althoff's Yellow Tools. Michael helped him understand that it was all about growing people first, not process improvement. He even pointed out that it says on the cover of the Two Second Lean book, 
The tagline under the title says, How to grow people and build a funneling culture. But 9 out of 10 people miss that. Most companies approach lean by throwing tools at people without building the culture first and then wonder why it's difficult to keep things going. There's nothing for the tools to hang on to because the people aren't engaged without building culture. So let's look at what the word culture means. Culture can either be built deliberately and nurtured or be an accident because the leaders aren't conscious of what behaviors, beliefs, and values they reinforce every day. In my experience, with most non-lean companies, it's the latter. Even if the company does all the corporate communication of what they want the culture to be, in terms of posters and visions and values and wall charts and proclamations, Rarely does the reality of what happens on the ground match that nice wallpaper. Telling them once and sticking it on the notice board simply doesn't work. This is also the reason for the title of this book, because culture isn't something told to people. Culture cannot be faked, and every organization has one. Culture is living and breathing. And it starts with how the leaders live and breathe, in actuality, not how they would like to live and breathe or behave, but how they actually do it. When the behavior, beliefs, and values that are actually practiced differ from those on the wall, then we have a misalignment, and it's not those on the wall that prevail. It's how we do things every day that's real. So for all organizations, Improvement starts with I because culture starts with I. While this is obvious for an organization's leaders, it's true for every individual within an organization. From the CEO to the new starter, culture ends collectively, but it begins with you. When I first got in touch with Paul Akers, my question was, how do I persuade the management team to do this? This is an edit of the actual first voicemail exchange I had with Paul, and the essence of this book is contained right here. What I tell everyone is, forget about everyone else, just focus on your waste and your problems. You have enough problems, enough waste for 10 lifetimes. Everything you touch becoming so magnificent that everyone is magnetized to what you're doing. You you become an extraordinary example. Remember, lean principle like 101, pull, not push. You will never successfully be able to push this on anyone, only if they want it. Pull, not push. How cool is that, that I still have a record of this first exchange with Paul? Anyway, back to the script. (laughs) I wasn't the number one person at this company, so I couldn't tell them what to do. Not that I would advise that in any case. So I started on the pull, not push strategy. I started to make improvements in my own work area. I started to make these cheesy little improvement videos. Check them out. (laughs) I started a WhatsApp group for myself and the rest of the management team to share improvements. I encouraged the rest of the management team to read, listen to the book. I started talking about waste in all my stand-up meetings. I started to get people curious about what this was all about. Starting with I, I became an overnight lean maniac. I was not the company owner, but even if I had been, this is the right approach. You will never push anyone into doing lean. Whether you're the company owner or the new starter who just got bitten by the lean bug, improvement starts with I. It's a pull system. You lead by example and become a magnet for the rest. It might not happen overnight. It takes time and perseverance, but it's also the most fun and fulfilling journey you will ever take in your career once you get the momentum. Again, a lean culture is something special, and it's a good idea to clarify where the journey may start for most organizations and the difference we are aiming for 
when growing people to build a lean culture together. This is huge because many of your team members may never have been asked, how can we do this better? Regardless of the slogans mounted on the wall, many may reckon they have been paid just for the work of their hands. They have been there to just do their job, punch the clock, whether in reality or just figuratively, and are not asked to use their heads much by doing a lot of thinking. It's great to clarify what we mean when we say we are growing people and building a lean culture together. It means we are all going to. I can't underline it here, but I mean it all. We're all going to learn to think and behave differently. We're all going to learn to see waste. We are all going to learn to leave our egos at the door. We are all going to learn to collaborate as equals. We are all going to learn to act creatively and run experiments to make improvements. We are all going to learn to embrace failure in the pursuit of excellence. We are all going to learn to bring mistakes to the surface, not hide them. We are all going to learn to speak without offending and listen without defending. We are all going to learn to have fun getting better at what we do every day. We are going to build strong, cohesive bonds in our entire team. We are all going to take pride in becoming the best in the world at what we do. This is what growing and developing people means. That's the bar. It's about stimulating each of us to want to do this and learning to be able to do this. Some of us will get it, straight away. Others will take longer. Others still might be repelled by it and never get it. Led properly though, that number will be few, as the vast majority of people would much rather come to a workplace where they are truly valued, respected, and encouraged to grow. I would argue that the prevailing attitude in the world today is, everyone wants everyone else to change to make the world suit them. It's a lazy, passive attitude, and one that means you as an individual are disempowering yourself because you're in control of nothing. Everyone else is doing it. Improvement starts with I means that when there's a problem, you look at what you can do about it, how you contribute, and what you can change. This goes from the top to the bottom of the organization chart. I've lost count of the number of times I've interacted with a leader, manager, or team member who says, why won't they do X? Or why aren't they doing Y? When I ask, well, are you doing it? The answer is always, and I mean always, the same. No. Along with some mumbled phrase like, uh, I hadn't thought of it like that. You can't sell what you haven't bought yourself. Be the behavior you want to see. The simple structure and discipline of a morning meeting builds culture and solves this problem when executed with purpose. This is because expectations are set and behavior is reinforced as a team with every single person, every single day. No ambiguity. It is so beautiful in its simplicity. It was only a week or two after my first visit to Seeding Matters that I started on my own lean journey with that first company and began to really apply this principle. Since then, I've been extremely fortunate to have had the opportunity to lead or help other people get started on theirs. This has led me to develop an overall process to create the environment and make the most of that system every time. It works to drive engagement improvement and results in a variety of environments in that order hands well everybody's doing that whether you're lean or not then hearts then heads this is a really important point to make this early on that is the order of proceedings engagement 
improvements, results. That's the process and it's simple. If you can pick up a broom, you can be engaged. We all can. And to be successful, we all must. From the CEO to the junior starter, from the office people to the operational staff, no exceptions. This levels the playing field, building mutual respect for everyone, regardless of their place on the organization chart. Everyone realizes that they matter. If everyone starts to raise standards by cleaning the work environment every day, they will soon begin to ask questions like this. Do we have enough brooms? Management, can we buy more brooms? Yes or no? Will management support us? Why do I struggle to find brooms every day? Hey, we need a place for each broom. Maybe we should standardize where they're kept. Where's all this dirt coming from anyway? Could we fix it at the source? Why is X broken? Why do we have so many of... And so on, and so on, and so on. As we develop, we find more problems when we clean. We ask more and more questions. And providing that leadership support appropriately, that foundation of engagement is layered with knowledge. We see improvements, and as we become more productive through countless improvements, we get those results. Too many people fail because they want results straight away, or even improvements. It simply doesn't work that way. Lean is built on hearts. It's built on engagement. Like Ryan Tierney says, if you get that, the rest just comes. As we say in Lean, everything in life is a process or the outcome of a process. And the process we present in this book adds even more clarity to the content of Paul Aker's book, acting as a set of stabilizers that can help you avoid some of the pitfalls if you just do it. Our process consists of the five C's. Number one, candor. Number two, commitment. Number three, coaching. Number four, consistency. Number five, continuous learning. These are the key steps you need to go through in order to really do lean. If any of them are missed, you will fail. It's like a bird trying to fly on a broken wing. You and your organization will flap around a lot but your efforts will not get off the ground. All of them require effort from the individual and collective energy from the organization. But when you put in that energy to build the new culture, the energy required to sustain it will be less. It's like building a new habit or quitting an old one. It can be tough at the beginning, but it gets easier. Improvement starts with I can help your organization become a shining beacon of success making your life easier and more fun without the normal daily friction and firefighting. It's a simple process, but not easy. Like Michael Altoff says, lean is hard work that makes life easy. I often use the imagery with an entire client organization of people driving to work with their fingers tapping on the steering wheel. Is that you right now? Well, would you like it to be? If so, read on. P.S. At the end of each chapter, I list the key takeaways for that given chapter. I hope you find them useful. Enjoy the book. Takeaways for the foreword. Most people misunderstand lean as being primarily about improving processes, when it is really about building culture and growing people, and that starts with each of us. As individuals, I. Lean is not a dry analytical process, it's a vehicle to drive complete team engagement and total participation. Lean needs to be reinforced every day, or it will always be very difficult to build or sustain a real lean culture. Just to go a little off script here, you can find details of how to contact me directly in the video description, or in the resources section of the Lean Play app. So if you've got questions or feedback as you go through the book, just drop me a line. I'd love to hear from you. There are also details of my YouTube channel that I post to regularly. You might find it useful to subscribe. 
as well as links to the Lumen Electronics website and GembaDocs.com, our game-changing software for creating standard operating procedures and Kanbans. So, now, off to chapter one. This is going to be fun. So, hope you enjoyed the foreword. Now we're going to dive into the book proper and get into chapter one. The first C, candor. The Oxford English Dictionary defines candor as the quality of being open and honest, frankness. Let's get this out of the way really quickly. Candor is the foundation upon which any great lean organization is built. You could justifiably say that no one gets to live a truly outstanding life without a strong dose of directness. It's about being able to be honest with yourself and others so that changes can be triggered. Without candor, things get stuck. Rather unfortunately though, candor has become an increasingly rare commodity in today's society. From our education systems breeding a culture of awarding everyone a medal, to parents only wanting to be positive with their children. It has led to a situation where real candor can be considered shocking. That conditioning over recent decades has led to the common belief that nice is good and directness is rude. Quite frankly, it's a shame. The result of this inability to be honest with oneself and with other people leads to a huge amount of dysfunction in our lives. I'm not just talking about the workplace, but also in our personal lives. Niceness is often just another word for being too weak to express one's dissatisfaction. And this form of niceness is certainly not the altruistic act it is often portrayed to be. The thing is, making that choice to be nice but weak, or direct and candid, is a personal one. And that's why we can say that candor starts with I. Often, people take the nice option because it's easy in the short term. However, being too nice is often the root cause of why most companies have internal dysfunctions between owners, individuals, and departments. People don't have the courage to tackle situations head on and instead walk out of meetings with the important things left unsaid, only for the bitching to happen behind closed doors and among friendly colleagues. Meanwhile, the walls of the silos only grow higher and the dysfunction grows worse, all while the organizational environment becomes stagnant and stale. In the long term, a lack of candor costs big. My good friend Alex Ramirez, a 25-year oil and gas veteran of senior positions and who was responsible for probably the best lean culture implementation in the world, during 2020, I kid you not, told me a great story about how candor had impacted his lean journey. He told me it was the main reason they got started down this road. Here is his story, as told by Alex himself. I used to go to one of our plants every month to review their progress with their continuous improvement teams using a methodology that we as an entire company have been following for over 20 years. You have to understand, this is a multi-billion dollar organization. The system was very strong, but it was tedious, systematic, and very tool-driven approach that had our guys presenting data, discussing problems, which sounds good, but there is a lot of waste in that process. We were focused more on using the tools and many tools that we had. They're very good tools and focused on presenting the graphs in a nice little dashboard that actually having really people focused on just fixing what bugged them. At the time, we had a recent new plan manager, but it was a veteran from inside the group. He was someone that I really trusted, a great guy, and we could speak candidly. And so I asked them this question. Hey, why is it not working? Why is it that every time I come to review the continuous improvement teams, it's just not working? 
And he looked back at me right straight into the eyes and said, Alex, do you really want to know the truth? Hey, of course, dude. What the hell? I answered. Then he replied, well, Alex, honestly, we are just putting a show for you to make you happy. We want to comply with the standards and we want to follow it by the book. Wow, that let me stun. I just answered, thank you so much. And let me get back to you on that. I did not know what to answer. I was stunned and I was embarrassed. Then I thought about it and thought about it through the weekend. I was like, how could I miss this? I felt embarrassed. You know, it was like, how could I not see that they were just doing this to please me? I really felt bad. How did I miss it? It was beyond my comprehension. And I was just expecting that if we followed the standard, this formula would work. And I was really pushing for these continuous improvement teams. And don't get me wrong, there is some good to it. But again, there was a lot of waste. At the time, we had hired a great engineer coming from our Brazil division. His name was Edson. He showed me two second lean. I'm going off script a little bit. I remember the day that Edson came to me and said, Alex, Alex, there is a option out there. But I know that as soon as I show you this, you're not going to follow the standard. Matter of fact, you're not even going to listen to me. And I was like, come on, dude, show me what it is. Back to script. And I was like, this is it. He had shown me two second lean. And I contacted Paul Akers. And the rest is history when my team could just tell me to my face that we're just pleasing you. This stuff doesn't work. It's just more of the same. I had a big hensei to myself. This means a self-reflection in Japanese. And what I found was that I was offering these guys something not worthy. And it is hard because that is the corporate norm. That was our standard. You apply the continuous improvement team methodology and you expect to have the results, the full engagement. It's just following the book. I was being a good student, but then having to take that decision to having to go somewhat against the establishment, something that is going against 20 years that we have learned was not totally good. I need to find something better for these guys. When I showed Two Second Lean to that original plan manager, and he started running with it, he saw great results. But where I really had it going was in Houston. And that is just because one single reason, I was involved. I got up every day and it was at 5 o'clock in the morning for the first shift and at 3 o'clock in the evening for the second shift. In our morning meeting and improvement time, I was present. I wanted to drive that change from the top down. And there was amazing results, amazing results. And you see, what I have learned is we were focused on many of the great tools we have. The problem with that is it didn't tell us how to get people engaged. If you have the hearts and minds of people, you will rock and roll. Just a little ad lib here. I just want to say thanks to Alex for sharing this story. It really helps to demonstrate the beauty of candor. Back to the script. This story shows the four stages of candor necessary to have a truly great lean culture. Those four stages are the courage to stop, the courage to speak up, the courage to listen, and the courage to act. For Lean to flourish and for candor to become a part of the culture, we need to foster all four of these aspects. A lot of what needs to be done is to eliminate any fear in the organization so that people feel safe enough to exhibit this kind of behavior. To get started, someone needs to have the kayones to pull the and on. That's a Japanese word for a stop cord that anyone on the line can pull when there's a problem. And production stops until they fix it. It's a perfect example of raising defects. If that facility is not there, that safety to stop, 
then things generally just carry on being dysfunctional and stale. In Alex's case, he was motivated to take the first step to stop just by being fed up enough of going through the motions. Essentially, he was just fixing what bugs him. If he hadn't stopped, the rest of the process might never have happened. They could still be having their boring, not very effective CIT meetings, and their lean journey would never have gotten off the ground. For 20 odd years, the management team of that plant, and the entire organization for that matter, had presented their graphs to the seagull coming from corporate, that's Alex in this case, and everyone just kept on repeating the process without questioning it. The chances are that everyone involved found the process tedious, even hating it, but they all kept up the charade because no one was ever willing to stop and ask, does this make any sense? The thing is, someone has to have courage to call BS, and that's where improvement starts with I comes in. There's no good waiting for someone else to do it. You have to do it. When there is a struggle or a mindless, wasteless routine that becomes evident. For leaders in an organization, improvement starts with I because you need to lead by example, by calling stop. When it becomes evident that a process is working below par, a big part of a lean leader's role is to make it safe for their team members to stop too. Creating what is known in lean circles as a stop culture. This needs to be incorporated into your behavior. We will go through that in the next steps. The second step, speak up, would be candor in its most traditional form. The meaning that most people think of when they hear the word. That is both Alex and his plant manager having the courage to speak up and discuss openly why the sacred corporate cow is not working. How often have we witnessed the stop moment, especially when the big boss stops and there is a stony silence as we just carry on with business as usual? No one is brave enough to take the chance and speak up to say what is needed. Speaking up is a function of courage and safety. The courage part is on the individual and the safety part is the job of leadership to create that safe environment where problems are surfaced not hidden, and processes, not people, are attacked. In Alex's instance, it's important he wasn't speaking up to point out someone else's failure or accuse them of anything. He was stopping to ask, why is this process not working? He wasn't blaming anyone or attacking them. He was bugged by the process, not the people. It's a big distinction, and he was taking responsibility for the situation, with his candor in stopping. Improvement starts with I. A common problem for business leaders is to look at their organization's culture, processes and systems and wonder why they're not as good as they would like them to be. Often, the leader's first reaction will be to blame influences other than themselves. For example, it's hard to get good people today. People don't want to work in our area. We can't get people. Corporates say we have to do it this way, etc., etc., etc. This attitude is usually the prevailing one regarding the majority of business leaders. They will not accept responsibility for the situation they find themselves in, which means they feel powerless to influence it, which means they do not take action to change. This is an illustration of improvement starts with I, in this case where it doesn't start at all. I'm here to tell you that this attitude is total nonsense. There are world-class companies everywhere with great people who are completely engaged and produce outstanding work in the same environment in which your company has become dysfunctional. Seating matters literally have waiting lists of people wanting to work there. And to get in the door isn't easy. Yet practically every other company in our area really struggles to get a warm, upright body to work for them. What's the difference? I hear you ask. Simple. It's leadership. The truth is that no matter what company culture looks like, good or not so good, 
You as the leader created it. No one else, not the government, not society at large, and certainly not some conjecture The people aren't as good as they used to be. You hired the people, even if you didn't directly. Therefore, it's your responsibility. Your behavior sets the tone. What you tolerate, you accept. Unfortunately, what is true in most organizations that don't have a lean culture is that they have simply become comfortable with their dysfunction. They believe the dysfunction is normal and just something that needs to be tolerated. The outliers and the world-class companies among us prove that is not the case. Even if you aren't one of the business leaders in your organization, whatever position you happen to occupy, you are there now. No one else put you there. Spiritually, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. It's karma, baby. Karma. There are no accidents. The great news about this simple truth is that when you do it, you can undo it. You are in control of what happens next. You are in control of building something better. The thing is, though, as Einstein famously said, a problem cannot be solved at the same level of consciousness as that on which it was created. So you need to raise your level or get out of the way and let someone else do it. Taking that level of responsibility for your situation is not easy for many people. But if you can manage to do it, it is a liberating experience for most. It can be quite stressful trying to control other people, as well as any external factors that might arise. When you take this level of responsibility and the realization that you did it, then your first job is to assess yourself and your own contribution to the current status quo and work on that. This can get really deep. And some fundamental questions call for real candor. You need to ask yourself about how you see not only the world, but your own attitudes and beliefs that will determine whether you have what it takes to be a real lean leader. For leaders, it's about believing that people are fundamentally good and actually want to do a good job. We can see that Alex had this deeply held belief even before he consciously started on his real lean journey. If your belief system includes thinking that people are just not built that way and will do as little as they can get away with and can't be trusted, then it's going to be very difficult for you to be a leader within a lean organization. Lean leaders come out of the box with a deep caring and respect for people. If that isn't an already embedded character trait of yours, then it's very hard to learn and impossible to fake. Essentially, to have that, you need to have humility towards others in a certain way, which means that you don't actually believe you have all the answers. Your entire team can contribute towards creating a better company. Lean leaders think their team has all the answers. Managers, those are not lean leaders, but occupy a supervisory position on the organization chart. They think that they themselves have all the answers and that the team just needs to be told what to do. If you're in the latter camp, you need to change this attitude or start polishing your resume if your company is serious about leading a lean future. We recently discussed this in the Lean Maniacs group. That's a chat group on Signal founded by Dave Lalonic of Sticky RX. For lean people to share best practice and improvements, it's amazing. Anyway, back to the script. We were discussing the difference between the three types of leadership. Dictators, they're just people who tell people to do it my way. Empowerment types, who just tell people to do it your way with little or no guidance. And finally, lean style, who say, follow me and we'll figure out how to do this together. This latter style is what we're after. In this way, lean leaders aren't telling but are much more about asking. Not giving prescriptive solutions to the team, but helping them solve problems creatively. Never relinquishing ownership for the challenges. When leaders give people answers to their problems, in a way, they also take responsibility for solving them. Which is not a good thing for anyone involved. No one grows in this scenario. 
I had some early training on this in my second automotive job when I was a young quality manager. Every morning, I would do my rounds at the plastic injection molding shop where I worked. There were around 40 different machines in production areas. This led me to want to know about any ongoing problems that my nature immediately made me want to fix for my colleagues. Not because I was a dictator, but simply because I was a good-natured chap who didn't know any better. Thankfully, my operations director above me could see what was happening. By the time I'd finished my round, I'd get back to my desk, heavily weighted down after having collected at least half a dozen problems that I'd personally taken on the responsibility for solving. He said to me, Do you know that you've just picked up a bunch of monkeys? I replied I had no clue what he was talking about. He described the process of me engaging with one of the tool setters on problems with the setup. He said, He is a problem, a monkey, and he wants to give it away to someone. He sees you coming and he's very happy to let you have it, for that monkey to be put on your back. When he explained the scenario this way, the penny dropped. His advice was to help, coach, support, and ask questions, but never to accept the monkey. Keep it where it belongs. It was great advice that has never left me. Keep the monkeys where they belong. It's better for everyone. For Lean to work properly, it must be authentic. It must be about building culture and growing people at its heart. Have that as your genuine focus and the results will come. Again, back to the beginning of my career. At Rockwell, all of us who worked there wore the same green uniform, from junior engineers like me to the operators on the shop floor and right up to senior managers. There weren't any management car parking spaces or a management canteen. We all used the same car park and the same eating area. There was a visitor's bathroom at reception, but apart from that, we all used the same set of bathrooms. Our culture was heavily influenced by our main customers, who happened to be Japanese auto manufacturers. I was working as a quality engineer, and when we responded to quality concerns, our customers would not let us write operator error on the corrective action documents. This would have been traditional up until that point. All the European customers, such as GM, were much more laid back about such things. However, it was drilled into us by our Japanese customers that it was always a process issue, never a people issue. If someone made a mistake, it was because the process was not robust or clear enough or the operator had not been adequately trained. There always had to be a real root cause, a process or a system issue. We could not just blame the individual. So I had these beliefs and attitudes ingrained into me within this environment, and therefore I felt that I already got lean at this level. If you're reading this and these points resonate, brilliant. If that doesn't sound like the kind of environment you would enjoy, it could be time to reflect. Coming back to our Alex example, the original plant manager trusted him because he already knew that Alex walked and talked these values. So it felt safe for him to speak up. If you want to have real candor within your organization, it's especially important for the leaders to start thinking and acting in this way. Make it safe for the people, yet attack bad processes every day. As for the rest of your organization, be brave. When you see a problem that is in your area, within your scope of control, Speak up and get on with the process of addressing it. The third essential component of candor is the courage to listen and introspect. When we listened to Alex's story, he received information that on the one hand he asked for, but on the other, and this is important, it's a problem that he would rather not be hearing. This is a component of candor that is rarely talked about. Everyone focuses on giving out feedback. But what good is that if we don't have an environment where that candor can be respectfully received? We had an expression that my leadership mentor at O'Lair, an amazing gentleman called Angus MacLeod, drilled into us. It was actually one of the ground rules that we would reiterate at the beginning of our international meetings. And that was, 
Speak without offending. Listen without defending. It would have been so easy for Alex to go into self-defense mode of fight or flight when the plant manager told him about the corporate wallpaper they had been putting up for so long. It can seem like a personal attack when someone points out a failing in what you've been doing or how you've been behaving, which is why even when we are giving candor, we should be careful to be as respectful around the language we use as we possibly can be especially when a situation is heated. It is something that requires self-control. In Alex's case, he felt foolish. He had been part of this charade for years. How could I have missed this? In my experience, it takes a deeply secure person to be able to receive candor like this. Insecure people tend to puff out their chests and go on the offensive, or try to deflect the problem. Of course, if our environment is like that, Who's going to exhibit candor? Only the very brave or the very stupid? Secure people have the maturity to be bigger than their instinctive drive to go into fight or flight. They can take a deep breath, relax, and ask for more dialogue. Instead of trying to run away or defend, they can lean in and ask for more to get to the why. That type of behavior might not be natural for everyone. But with practice, the response can become habitual. We need to build a culture that drives out both fear and makes it safe for people to surface problems. To build candor, it's safety first. The fourth essential aspect of candor is to act. Angus also used to use another quote, Vision without action is a daydream. Action without vision is a nightmare. I've since found out that it's commonly claimed to be a Japanese proverb or has sometimes been attributed to Soichiro Honda. At the end of the day, we can have all the stopping, speaking up and listening, but if it's not followed up by action, wasn't it all just hot air? Alex realized that he had to offer something else, and when he was presented to Second Lean by Edson, here was the solution to take into action. By doing so, he finally allowed the innate energy of the organization to express itself. If we take a step back to reflect, I'm sure that everyone reading this who has ever worked in an organization of more than two people can relate to this simple four-step candor process. An easy one to pick is that meeting we all hate, but we all just go along with it, go through the motions and no one ever speaks up. My own personal worst example of this was when I worked at O'Lair, and our CEO insisted on bringing together around 20 of the most senior people in the company, most of them managing directors of entire countries, for two days every single month. It was the worst organized meeting structure I've ever witnessed. Sorry, Mike. Typically, the agenda tried to do far too much. Everyone's presentation overran its timing, Then we would try to make decisions on strategic issues. That was the worst part. Trying to make a decision with 20-odd, strong-willed people was just like pulling teeth. I likened those discussions like making the decision to operate on someone, opening them up, poking around for a few hours, and then just leaving them. Wound wide open. It would have been better all round if we'd never bothered in the first place as all we did was create a lot of damage in terms of arguments and bruised egos without having resolved anything. It was also common practice for people to sit answering emails on their laptops while someone presented to the group, which I found desperately rude. The meetings started at 8.30 in the morning and rarely finished before 7.30 at night. It was exhausting. They were the only times that I genuinely thought about resigning from the company that I dearly loved. And that's the absolute truth. Eventually, I just had enough. I pulled the stop cord. I cornered my CEO, now a good friend called Mike Blankensop, and I had the courage to speak up. I told him that I thought the meetings were blank. (laughs) Hardly speak without offending, but I don't pretend to be perfect. I told him about the worst issues and asked if I could have the opportunity to run it my way. He found it unsettling 
but to his credit, he listened anyway. In the end, he was happy to agree because he hated running them too. So in the end, it was not that difficult to act. It's amazing how it often takes just one single person to exhibit candor about a bad situation and then everyone heaves a sigh of relief that someone has finally broken the cycle. It wasn't my job to take responsibility for fixing this problem, but that's what lean people do. It doesn't matter where we sit in the organizational chart. We step up and take total responsibility. I ran those meetings like Genghis Tom. Total clarity, total candor. Every meeting started with the ground rules. Speak without offending, listen without defending. No open laptops or answering emails during the meeting. Every presenter would have the full and respectful attention of all present. Half-hour breaks were planned, allowing people to socialize and attend to urgent operational issues. We had strict agenda and timings. Everyone who presented had to send me their presentations at least three days before the meeting, and I would vet them for quality and quantity of content. No more 80-slide presentations for a half-hour slot. I designed the meetings to be predominantly about one-way communication, one person to many, no big discussions, anything that needed a decision. I asked for a show of hands of people who cared passionately about subject X, and they could form a working group that would present back to the entire group on their decision at the next meeting. No more endless open-heart surgery discussions. We finished and started on time, so people could chat informally, socialize and build connections, which was the real reason for the meeting in the first place. It was just a black and white transformation, and everyone, and I mean everyone, just loved it. We all really looked forward to the meetings, so fun and productive, and having the time to build friendships. It just takes one person to exhibit candor, and that pent-up, frustrated energy can be released. That one person can be anyone. Improvement starts with I. I recently discussed this kind of candor with one of my lean buddies, Brannon Burton of Sunrock Construction in the USA. And he told me about a practice he does with new recruits that blew me away. Here is Brannon to tell you about it himself. Being candid can be really tough, particularly when a new employee comes in. The problem is they don't know very much about you, and when you have to give them correction in the future, they may think they're in big trouble or that you're going to fire them. In order to get around this when I first meet with an employee, I like to set a new expectation so they know how I work, and I usually say something like this. As you start your career here at Sunrock, I want you to understand a little bit about how I work. Your development is very, very important to me. So much so that I'll need to make course corrections and I want to give you really clear feedback. The reason that I'm telling you this is because I don't want you to think you're in trouble when I give you that feedback or that I don't like you or that I'm going to fire you or something like that. When I give you feedback, it's because I care about you and want you to be the best that you can be. I care about you so much that I'm willing to say things clearly. That's the message I want you to hear. This frames all future encounters I have with them. It allows you to be candid without sending the wrong message. These are messages of care and concern, not disgust or aggression. The really important message here is it's not about the person delivering the feedback. The energy behind it is a giving energy. It's there to help the person receiving it. Thanks, Brannon. Like many people, he himself finds candor difficult. Taking this approach allows him to set the groundwork. There is nothing wrong with you. This means they will know early on if there are course corrections they need to make. The really important message here is that it's not about the person delivering the feedback. The energy behind it is a giving energy. It's there to help the person receiving it. He sets the individual's expectations to expect candor and gives them an opportunity to understand the intention behind it. Now that's leadership. So now we're going to talk about a controversial part of building candor. Change the people or change the people. Early in the lean process, you need to be candid, first with yourself and then with others. If your team will not 100% authentically align around lean, you will always be pulling a dead weight. 
a long road of frustration. For the employees of a company going through a lean culture transformation, the majority of people will absolutely join in if the leadership does a good job of starting with themselves. It's a pull, not a push process. You will never push anyone into doing lean. In my experience with creating change in organizations, there will always be early adopters who get it straight away and want to run with the change. Great. Encourage them and give them tons of recognition to pull the people on the fence to come on board. That will be a bigger group who will want to wait and see. And they're asking, are they really serious about this? We could view them as the silent majority. When you start having morning meetings, you will know exactly what I mean. There can be a variety of reasons for this. It just takes most people time to understand what is happening and buy into it. The leadership needs patience around that. We'll delve more into that later in the book. There are also invariably people who just don't enjoy lean done in this way. They think that they're above it. That's the candid truth. What's all this waste business? I know this already. Why do we have to do this every day? They don't open their hearts to it and resist the change in their minds. Often these people were doing really well in the old system of tribal knowledge where they held power because they were the best firefighters and on some kind of pedestal for that. Playing as equals in the team can be a big dent in their ego, so they resist. Now it's not that these people can't be won over with great leadership. They certainly can. However, my advice is to be honest with yourself. Be really candid. Are you willing to make the hard changes that might be necessary to win a fantastic lean culture? Sometimes those people will just have to go. I've personally seen it too often, in a family business for example, where the lean guy is constantly frustrated at the culture not taking hold, without realizing it's the lack of alignment in the senior team that is people experience every day that is holding things back. It takes a lot more work to build a lean culture than it does to tear it down. One ill-placed comment from a non-aligned leader to a staff member ripples through the whole organization, especially in a small to medium company, and it's clear to all that the company as a whole doesn't really mean it. Frustration and mediocrity will continue without action to resolve the root cause. If for one reason or another you can't, or more likely don't want to, change the people or change the people, don't try to go down the lean road. Now there's some serious candor from me. Those individuals can choose for themselves about how they want to respond to lean, but if they aren't willing or able to change, that choice needs to be made for them. They need to be moved on by leadership. I'm not beating around the bush here, and if you're serious about lean, neither will you or your organization's leadership. Paul Akers fired his brother-in-law early on in their lean journey because he was actively obstructing progress. I know of other similar examples within the lean community. If you want greatness, you need total candor and alignment. In my first two-second lean organization, there was daily interpersonal friction and sometimes screaming arguments. It was pretty toxic, but I never saw anyone actually get fired, no matter what the problem was. So when we started with morning meetings and preaching respect for people, it was a huge shift and the vast majority of people embraced it. Like, why not? However, there's always one, or maybe two or three. We had a relatively new team member who wouldn't get on board with Lean, especially the 3S and cleaning part integral to building culture. He eventually told his team leader to blank off <laughs> and tried to intimidate him physically. When I heard about this, I told the senior team that he had to go, no exceptions. I encountered the we're struggling to get people and he's really good at X arguments that many reading this would have heard before. I responded that this level of disrespect had to be met with zero tolerance, no exceptions. None of them wanted to fire the guy though. You do it, I was told. Well, improvement starts with I. So I took responsibility, got on the phone with the guy and fired him on the spot. With candor, I told him exactly why. 
That kind of behaviour would never be tolerated here. He couldn't believe it, as he had bought into the story that no one was ever fired from this place. The next day, in the morning meeting, I told the rest of the team that he was gone. And why? And that things were changing. I'll be best friend to those who want to get on our train and be patient with those still getting used to the idea. But if you're actually against us, I will enjoy firing you. Not because I'm a nasty individual, but because I see it as the right thing to do, so that the rest of us can have a world-class place to work. Candor like this breeds clarity, and generally, people like that. The short-term, easy route would have been just to go with the flow of the senior management team. But improvement starts with I, especially when it comes to candor. When I worked in France doing a culture turnaround, one of the French senior managers told me this phrase, pour encourager les autres. It comes from the times of the French Revolution and means to encourage the rest, used in reference to public beheadings by guillotine. It's simple. If you were a leader, you might have to encourager les autres if someone is blatantly not getting on board with the change. It shows that leadership is serious about the change and differentiates between those that are coming on board and those that are not. If leadership openly tolerates people fighting with the system, soon the others will ask themselves, why am I bothering? and stop putting the effort into lean. Don't measure the evolution of your organization by the behavior of those at the top end of your lean engagement. Measure it by those at the bottom. If you're one of the autres, it's time for you to change or be changed. Either get on board or find somewhere else to pursue your career. Now there's some more candor for you. A common problem is the we can't do without X person. Phenomenon. I mentioned above. Even though this individual behaves like an a-hole and you've had umpteen conversations about it, they don't change. However, they've got so much knowledge or are such a hard worker that the leadership team is worried if they can survive without them. My own experience and that of countless other lean leaders is that there has to be zero tolerance when it comes to embracing lean, especially for senior people. The only problem is waiting and tolerating a bad apple in the barrel for too long. Just do it. Especially if it's a manager. You will likely find a wealth of energy and creativity waiting to be unleashed when that person moves on. No one is bigger than the company. And even if there are a few weeks of disruption while you work out how to fill the gap, it is always much better in the medium term. If you move people out, make sure you apply a good screening to anyone you move in. One screening tool we use at my company is to get people to read Two Second Lean during the recruitment process and then quiz them on it. Either they get it or they don't. And if they don't get it, we don't let them in. With time, your internal lean culture building process and a filter to only bring great people in your culture will only get stronger and stronger. Change the people or change the people. We have looked at the process of aligning individuals within the team with lean using the change the people or change the people approach. But often there are things beyond the individual and even the department level that will inhibit lean from taking hold within an organization. From experience, I've found that in particular, the organization's key performance indicators, or more specifically any departmental targets, can be a huge cause of friction, conflict, and internal dysfunction. I've seen these patterns repeat over and over. Sales departments that are purely driven by sales and engage in friction-creating activities, like making delivery promises they know will likely not be kept by production, just to win orders and hit targets. Supply chain teams that are driven by production output without on-time delivery or quality targets, leading to small individual order lines becoming months late 
with lots of screaming customers that sales and service people have to deal with. Even just the cadence that a business mainly runs on causes dysfunction. Most businesses are driven by the month, which causes huge unevenness with production rushes at the month end, resulting in stress and endless waste. Changing the focus to weekly or daily just smooths things out. I've seen that effect so many times. My second job in automotive had me as a quality manager of a 100 people company. My office was located just at the corner of the shop floor on the main thoroughfare to the warehouse dispatch area. This is where I got to see the KPI cadence effect firsthand. Every day was the same rhythm. Everything was relatively calm until about 3.30 p.m. Then, up until 5 o'clock, which was our finish time, total pandemonium. People literally running up the aisle with boxes to be dispatched as we got closer to 5 o'clock. And the reason for that? Our psycho managing director had a sales target of £25,000 a day. If that was met, great. If it wasn't met, he would come down to the shop floor in his three-piece suit, turn purple, and make like a hairdryer to the production manager, team leaders, and anyone else unfortunate enough to be within shouting distance. Now, I'm not saying this is a good thing. It's just that whatever your consequential measure, it will dictate your business rhythm, which can really cause problems. During my French turnaround, the monthly sales graph was like a hockey stick. And that was just because no one from the management team really cared about sales until the last week of the month, when they would have to report to their masters. So the rush was always on then. So for us, just to smooth it out better, we moved to weekly measures. And guess what? No more hockey stick. Simple. Let's surface those kinds of issues within your organization now. Be candid with each other as a team and start to have measures that build alignment, not create barriers towards it. For that to happen, we need candor within our team, with each of us taking responsibility. Forget the past. It's about getting better. Improvement starts with I. As well as the KPIs, simply how people are paid can be a major issue in some organizations. We need to align pay with the behavior we expect, or as a minimum, make sure that we pay people is not an active disincentive to teamwork and improvement. At the first business where I implemented Two Second Lean, the financial incentives for the shop floor were one of the biggest problems towards moving forward with Lean. In fact, I insisted that we didn't even start with morning meetings and the rest of the process until we had resolved it. An ancient piece rate system was in place, paying people purely on output. If a worker had poor output, he got minimum wage. This led to people specializing in a particular machine, informally becoming their machine because they could easily hit the target. They didn't want to cross train to learn new machines because they would be on minimum wage during the training period. They also didn't want to waste time training other people because they would lose output, find themselves on minimum wage, and lose the hold on their machine as well. Let's just say that they didn't encourage teamwork. An attendance bonus was also in place that the same 80% of people received all the time and the rest never did. If you were late a single morning or missed a day, you lost a month. Most of the time when someone was late or missed a day, they did it multiple times in a month. It clearly didn't do anything to motivate anyone. It was a big challenge though to convince the leadership team to drop this structure and move to a different one, but we did it. This idea of metrics and payment leading the organization and not the actual leadership people is not an uncommon situation. They were relying on the payment structure to manage the people and were worried output would fall. However, it did not. And taking the time to change the payment structure before we started morning meetings worked a treat. It showed the entire organization that we were very serious about the change. We changed to a new payment structure based on three main categories, hands, heart, and head. 
We explained that we had only paid for output historically, but now the hands meant how many different machines they could skillfully operate. Heart was about how well they worked within the team, and head was about how they contributed to improvements and developed their leadership skills. It provided a clear pathway to show everyone how they could progress within the company and laid out very clearly what we wanted from the team members. The two main business owners and I sat down with every single team member face to face and explained the change, why we were doing it, and that Lean was now the only way forward. No exceptions. We took responsibility to communicate the change effectively, eyeball to eyeball, with candor. Incidentally, we even changed job titles. We moved from operators to team members and from supervisors to team leaders. The second change was most important. The word supervisor intimates that the people need to be watched over because we don't trust them. Whereas team leader is someone who is a leader of a team of people. A subtle but very important difference. We also asked the previously named supervisors if they wanted to attend leadership training night classes, to which everyone signed up. These were all important changes to make to the organization to facilitate the start of changing to a lean culture. As we draw this chapter to a close, I would advise you to think of candor like a muscle, in the sense that you need to train it. Trust me, learning to build this muscle will be one of the best things you've ever done. And as you make that clear to the entire organization, things will only get better. Stop being comfortable with dysfunction. Start to develop a stop culture. When you see a struggle or things not going the way you would like, stop and reflect on what needs to change, always starting with yourself and taking action to fix it. Even the most natural of lean leaders need to practice this. As when things are not going the way you'd like, our natural tendency is to ask, why are they not doing X, Y, or Z? Remember that the first response from a lean leader when a situation like this arises is, am I doing it? Or building on that further, have I created the conditions for X, Y, or Z to happen? Have I created clarity around that expectation? Or have I just told them? Or have I provided a clear, documented process? Rarely is the answer to all these questions truthfully yes. You can't sell what you haven't really bought into yourself. That includes how you are building your lean culture. It's never about them. It's always about you. Improvement starts with I. And candor starts with I. Don't forget it. In the book, there's now a picture of a mirror, and underneath it, it says, here's where candor starts. So the takeaways from the candor chapter are as follows. Number one, candor has four stages. Stop, speak up, listen, and act. Creating a safe space for your organization to act this way is a big part of lean. Number two, Examine yourself and your team and commit that you will do whatever it takes to change the people or change the people. Number three, look at your KPIs and incentive methods. Do any of them actively work against lean? Chapter two, the second C, commitment. The quality of a person's life is in direct proportion to their commitment to excellence, regardless of their chosen field of endeavor. Vince Lombardi. Nothing worthwhile in life can be bought or delegated. Not your physical health, not a skill or an aptitude, not a beautiful relationship, nor an outstanding company culture. An analogy I've used with a recent client who makes high-end gym equipment that you'll become more familiar with later, after they had visited Seating Matters and wanted the same culture, was that it was like going to the gym and seeing some guy with a 12-pack of abs, a world-class physique, 
you decide you want the same. So you get a world-class coach to train you. That's great. The coach can advise you of the right steps to take to reach your goal, the exercise regime, the diet, and can even shout at you when you need motivation. Super! The unfortunate truth is, though, that only you can lift the weights. Only you can decide to eat clean and not eat the cheeseburger. Only you can make and keep the commitment to change. Only you can build your culture. Commitment starts with I. That guy with the world-class physique, with the 12-pack of abdominals, didn't get it by just popping into the gym for a few half-hours of half-assed workouts a week, or by wolfing down a pizza after a dozen beers every other night, did he? No. You only get to be world-class at anything, if that is your number one priority. If it's something you approach among your many priorities, it's highly unlikely that you will get outstanding results. Interestingly, the word priority was only used in the singular until the middle of the 20th century. Before that, the very essence of the word meant that there could be only one. We've been fooled into thinking that the word priorities is plural, which leads to a proliferation of multitasking and a lot of bland performance. When I look at someone like Paul Akers or Ryan Tierney, or frankly, anyone with one of those truly top-of-the-league lean organizations, I reckon that if you cut the leaders in half, it says lean. They live and breathe lean all the time. Total commitment. They are all extremely candid people, consumed with improvement. And as I said earlier, start first by improving what stares back in the mirror, themselves. Without a doubt, lean is their top priority, yet they are not one-trick ponies. Paul is a brilliant leader, a great business strategist, amazing sales guy, great public speaker, and voracious reader. He not only has an amazing company, but he also has done Ironman numerous times, traveled to over 100 countries, is a pilot, and has climbed to Everest Base Camp in Kilimanjaro, and on and on and on. How do you do all that? When you decide to make a commitment to growing a world-class lean culture, the thing is to realize that you are not saying no to lots of other things. You are just saying a wholehearted yes to first taking your personal development seriously and devoting time to that so that you can be a world-class leader within your organization so that in turn, it can become a world-class company with world-class people, processes, and products. For most of you reading this book, if you don't say yes to building a lean culture, you are saying yes to continuing dysfunction and mediocrity within an organizational environment that shouts average at everything it encounters. For 98% of people, that is their business life. It might be a nice environment with good results, but is it outstanding? Is it something truly spectacular? Would people want to travel from all over the world to learn how you do things at your place? The answer is likely to be a resounding no if you don't make a significant change to how you manage yourself and those around you. I'm going to quote Einstein again, and his applicable quote here is, The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again whilst expecting different results. A good question to ask about why you would want to commit to lean is, why do you actually want a lean organization at all? There are good reasons and not so good reasons that again will help you understand if this is for you. Many answers are on the right side of the spectrum to this question, just a few of which we can start to look at here. I want a world-class company. I want that positive energy that world-class lean organizations have. I want to eliminate stress and struggle that comes with having a disorganized mess, with all the firefighting that goes with it, never being able to take a break, the poor quality of home life that goes with that, and so on. Ultimately, some unmet psychological need is driving you to want change. 
The bigger the need, the more motivation you are fueled with to change. I got to Second Lean immediately because in my first company, the ownership team were pressuring me to implement Lean. And it was the only way I could see to accomplish the transformation. For Ryan Tierney of Seating Matters, he was so stressed out trying to run the factory that he googled, how do I run a factory? and came across Paul Aker's videos on YouTube. He was hooked immediately. He saw Two Second Lean as the only way to solve his problems, and he didn't have many options available at that time. For Paul Vallely of Cocoon Rugs, another amazing Two Second Lean company from Northern Ireland, it was greeting people who worked for him and receiving no response or a grunt. He did not want to spend his life working in that kind of dull, impersonal, lifeless environment where there were no connections and warmth within his organization. Here is Paul describing this in his own words. Yeah, so we started our lean journey back in 2018. And looking back for us, it was, uh, it was probably the only thing available that, that really done what we were looking, looking to do. And uh, it was certainly the only thing that worked. We had tried other things and we'd, we'd ruled out values and we'd, we'd tried to build engagement with the team. But, but for us, Two Second Lean was, was the only true tool that actually worked in terms of bringing engagement, kind of doing away with that, that grunt in the morning and, and that you know, terse passing of each other without really being engaged as a team or, or just as people in general. And, uh, and Two Second Lean really, really unlocked that for us and, and made us a genuine team. And, has produced levels of not just productivity, but an enjoyment and energy that, that we never thought was possible. He sees Two Second Lean as the best way to solve his problem. The specific reason might be different for many other lean leaders I know, but the outcome was the same. They saw Two Second Lean as the vehicle to transport them from a situation of discomfort to one of a better place. When they started to apply Two Second Lean principles, they gave it their full and singular focus. Frankly speaking, the bigger the pain, the greater the burning desire you have for your goal, the better. If you don't have a genuine burning desire at the heart of your motivation to build a lean culture, then you will likely give up when the going gets tough, as it most definitely will at some point. A burning boat certainly helps leaders make and keep to their commitment. When I analyze those business leaders that don't bother with lean, those people that visit lean organizations get blown away at what those companies achieve, but then go on to do nothing substantive themselves, I see three main reasons that lie behind their behavior. The first is that they don't understand what they're seeing. They see the physical improvements, witness the efficient working environment, communication boards and slick processes, and think that this is what they have to do. They try to copy the outcome, not what made it happen, which is focusing on growing people and building a culture that delivers those improvements. Just trying to copy the results will fall flat on its face, 99.9 times out of 100. The second reason is that they don't have enough discomfort in their current situation. Life could be good, maybe not brilliant or world-class, but there is not a big enough fire in the belly to find out more and move into action. Either that, or it's the excuse mindset mentioned earlier in the candor chapter. In any case, the result is zero commitment to change. Good is the enemy of excellent. Comfort does not stimulate transformative change. Pain does. So without perceiving a substantive reason to make that change, most leaders will choose the current status quo or make small, safe changes that don't go beyond the superficial in terms of culture change. In other words, they see options. Often lots of them. All of them easier than doing this lean thing that they don't really understand. That is the third reason. They don't know what to do next. Well, that is why this book was written. To give people a bridge to build from curiosity into action. Back to motivations. 
of those of you who are considering moving forward with Lean, on the not-so-good side of answers to the motivation question are those that sound like this. I want to make more money. Or alternatively, I want to get more out of my people. Or, I want more for less. The financial motivation is okay if it is at the lower end of your list of unmet needs. But if it's at the top of your list, forget it. Your people are not stupid. If you are using lean as just another way to manipulate them and exploit them more, they will sniff that out in short shrift, and the whole thing will monumentally fail. That is one of the reasons why lean often fails to get real, authentic buy-in within large organizations. Leaders are doing it not because they want to, but because they've been told to do it. It's about delivering the KPIs and the weekly, monthly, and quarterly results. It's all about results and improvements without understanding that the engagement drives those other things, those end results. There is no heart behind doing it. It's just another corporate tool, and in the worst examples, just another thing that corporate are piling on to an already stressed out organization. The thing is, every single real lean organization that I know makes money for fun like serious, serious coin compared to their competitors. And there's a very simple reason for that. It's because truly lean companies are very rare, and it's highly unlikely they have a competitor in their segment anywhere near as good as them. The excellent lean organizations have a fully engaged group of people, highly motivated to remove waste from everything they do, every day, with a servant attitude to their customers totally focused on delivering excellent value and service to their customers every single day. Does your business do that? At that kind of level of intensity? What do you think would happen to your results if it did? Think about that and consider what attitudes you might have to work on changing. The thing is, for Lean to work, it needs to come from the heart and speak to people's souls, not their wallets. It's sad but obvious. Everyone wants better, but very few are willing to change themselves first and then sustain that change long enough for the results to come. That is the second commitment you are making here, that whatever it takes, you are going to do it and you are not going to give up. I can tell you right now that you are going to hit a few speed bumps along the way because you are on a new road of discovery. True lean leaders hold on to their vision and keep going regardless, making adjustments but always with forward momentum. The best leaders enjoy the journey and understand that the undoubted challenges are an essential part of it. This is really important. The growth is actually hidden in those challenges because by overcoming them, you and your organization grow. To illustrate this spirit, let me give you an example of my very first day of proper two-second lean. After several months of working hard to convince the company's ownership team to just do it, I was midway through my very first morning meeting, full of enthusiasm for this amazing change, when it dawned on me that a good half of the 50 people in the audience had no clue at all what I was saying. Blank faces stared back at me. A good half of those people didn't understand English, as they were foreign nationals with barely a rudimentary grasp of the language. I hit my shock well and kept going, maintaining a good front for the rest of the day. But driving back home that evening in the car, I was really worried. What do I do with this? Will we be able to do this two-second lean thing at all? I felt like a total fool. After all this arm wrestling and convincing with the senior team, changing the payment structure and selling to every single individual how great Lean was going to be, was this project going to die before we even got started? I'd put my reputation totally on the line here. The truth was that I'd already gone too far. The commitment was already too great for me to go back. My reputation boat had been well and truly burned. In hindsight, that's a really good thing. I actually prayed. 
Then it hit me. These words came into my head. Use the problem as an opportunity. I got it straight away. I'd simplify all the communication, no more than a dozen words on any single presentation slide. And I used Google Translate to convert the text into six different languages. English, Polish, Lithuanian, Bulgarian, Latvian, and Hungarian. And I kept the education part as visual as possible. I also slowed down the education part of the morning meeting dramatically. I went much slower than I normally did, but it gave more time for the learning to sink in. I began with this approach the very next day, and right away it started to work like a treat. I asked Ramunas or one of the other good English speakers to translate other parts of what we were talking about into Russian or Lithuanian. And every morning meeting from then on, I made a real point of doing this. I would actually use it as a crutch if the meeting was falling a bit flat or getting a bit boring to stimulate some interaction and levity. I was very deliberate about including even the shy and retiring people who were nervous about speaking. Imagine the fear that many have about public speaking, but now multiply that because it's not your mother tongue to make contributions. For our book club every day, I posted translations from Google Translate and copied and pasted from this PDF foreign language versions of Two Second Lean into our company WhatsApp group so that everyone had an opportunity to learn. Of course, the translations weren't perfect, but that was half the fun. Every individual had to do a book club slot in the morning meeting. If their language was not up to it, one of their friends could translate it into English for them for the group. It stretched everyone, but brought them out of their comfort zone and into the group dynamic. Later, I asked for a translator volunteer called Normans, who would translate and explain key messages into Russian, which was the language most of the foreign guys could understand. It all really worked. I reckon the reason is that I showed that I truly cared about every single person in the organization and that no one who wanted to come with us on this journey would be left behind. Before this, for many of the foreign nationals, management didn't actually know their real name. So it was a night and day difference. It was a heck of a lot of work for me personally, but it was certainly worth it. If I had not given it 100% commitment, I would have failed. Honestly, I think 9 out of 10 people would have given up at that first hurdle, but I just would not. I refused. You can see some videos from what we achieved at that company in the resources section or in the description if you're listening on YouTube. I can sincerely tell you that I personally got huge growth out of the whole experience and also that those morning meetings and improvement times were some of the happiest times of my career. Just watching people blossom. The organization also exponentially grew as a team. It was fantastic. But it all grew out of what for many would have been a seemingly insurmountable obstacle. And that's why it takes some serious commitment for everyone to be truly great at lean. Can't can be translated as won't in many situations. The rest of what I talk about in this chapter is just helping you overcome some of the rational barriers you might have built up to saying yes to that commitment. Committing to lean does not mean that your business can't grow sales at an extraordinary pace, that you can't have a cash focus, or your product development can't be a key differentiator for your business if any of those things are strategically important to you. If you are an entrepreneur and you truly love lean, it will take away all the operational firefighting rubbish that means you can be stuck well and truly in the business. Instead, you can work on the business and you get to go kite surfing for a couple of months in South America while your well-oiled machine just gets on with what it does with a light touch from you. Paul Akers can do stuff like this. I've often said to people that if your business doesn't function without you standing in it every day, you aren't a true business owner. You have a job in a business that you happen to own. I recently came across a quotation that stated something very similar, but added, and your boss is a psychopath. What's important to understand is that no matter what the primary outcome you are after for your business, lean can be the vehicle that gets you there. 
To repeat what we said earlier, everything in life is a process, or the outcome of a process. So lean in itself is not the end, but it's a fantastic means to get to whatever end you seek. The focus is always continuous improvement, and that will improve all your people and processes constantly. If your competition is not doing the same, you can only develop a competitive advantage with better people, processes, products, or services. When you make a commitment to lean, you need to understand that the process of creating a lean culture is all about pull, with only a little bit of push. The pull starts with you becoming the lean practitioner, the triple X leader, who is the exceptional, extraordinary example every day. That means you are actively making improvements every single day within your own span of control. This means raising your own standards and addressing the problems you face every day, big and small. It means developing your own stop culture and living and breathing it at a high level all the time. This is your number one commitment, and it starts with I, not with pointing the finger at other people. If you truly embrace this, you cannot fail. I first encountered this kind of leader when I was in Japan with Paul Akers. In spite of all the early exposure to Japanese companies that I had the good fortune to have in the early part of my career, plus the fact that I've traveled all over the world, visiting over 50 countries myself, I'd never been to Japan. It was completely amazing to be exposed to that beautiful culture and environment for the first time. Everything was just better than home. You can see some of the videos I made during the trip in this chapter. Let's just say that the people just blew me away with their mutual respect for each other and their attitude to detail and quality. Everywhere in the country left a lasting impression on me. It won't be the last time I go there. Anyhow, what impressed me even more was being around Paul himself. He is a force of nature. He genuinely loves imparting his wisdom to others. It's certainly not about just making money for him. His candor is totally off the chart. If something isn't working, he has a very sensitive trigger to sense it and take action. He constantly improved everything around him, all the time. He never stopped. It wasn't a study mission about lean, it was a lean study mission. He wasn't just preaching lean, he was doing it, and he clearly loved sharing that knowledge with others so they could make their lives better. I made a short video on the difference between Paul Akers and normal people that summarizes these differences when I was at the airport on the way home from Japan. Anyhow, back to the Japan lean study mission. One of the best improvements was around how we managed the personal headset intercoms we all wore as we went around factories on tour so that we could hear each other. Most people would have just put them into a box when we were done, with that just becoming a tangled mess of wires. Instead of having everyone randomly return them back with wires hanging everywhere, Paul created a quality standard of how the wire would be wrapped around each one to reduce all the excess motion around all the wires becoming tangled. He then presented the new standard to us on PowerPoint on the bus to communicate so that we all knew about the standard, helping us understand that everything is a process. Then his assistant Mami-san came up with the idea of putting a number on each one to further reduce the struggle. It was amazing. I asked Paul, how many improvements do you make a day? His answer was, around 30 or 40. And having seen him in action, I believed him. I wanted some of that juice, that Kool-Aid that Paul was very evidently drinking. I resolved to myself, I made a commitment that I'm going to make at least five improvements a day from now on. About three days later, on the last day of the tour, I had failed abysmally. Literally not one improvement made. We were having lunch before the last afternoon of the trip, a visit to the Holy Grail of the Lexus plant. I told Paul about my failure. Well, at least I was candid. I asked him, how do you do it? How do you see all those improvements? 
Again, I was fortunate enough to capture his response on video. All you're doing is eliminating struggle. I see struggle and I see also what I'm seeing also is whenever I see something bunch up, that's a bottleneck and I immediately know there's no, there's no flow. So if you don't see flow, you've got an opportunity to improve. This is, you know, I walk on Fabric Floor and people go, how do you see all this stuff? I'm going, so a, a kindergartner can figure out what I'm doing. To be honest, I'd heard similar things from different people and other sources in the past. But this time, something was different. A switch tripped of understanding that has stayed and been refined until this day. Every time we see a struggle or things not flowing, there is an opportunity for improvement. It has been 118 weeks since that day, and I've made at least 25 improvements per week since then. I track and record them all in a fantastic habit-building app called Done. It's only on iOS, unfortunately. It's the most important app tool in my life. I use it to build and sustain habits by holding myself accountable. To hold myself to that commitment. There's a video on how I use the app. When you do that, when you are a triple X leader consistently, you will become a magnet, pulling your team with you. Eventually, all those who get it will be drawn to follow, and those who don't will fall away. Any who actively resist is where the little bit of push might come in. My friend Ryan Tierney at Seating Matters put it best when he said that lean leaders need to be sheepdogs, not bulldogs. The lean leader is not the bulldog rushing into the middle of the flock, barking, shouting and biting, being loud and egotistical, scattering the flock everywhere. The lean leader does not try to push anyone into doing lean. They are an altogether smarter beast than that. The sheepdog gently guides the flock, their people, for the vast majority of the time. The flock hardly knows that they're there, but they go along with the flow of the others. The sheepdog is constantly vigilant, making sure everyone is going in the right direction. If one or two go the wrong way, he makes his presence felt with a look, a bark, or even a nipped bite so they can correct their course. The flock can go long distances under the guidance of a good sheepdog, but before they even know it, they're in the pen and it's all over. That is the commitment you need to make a decision on. That is what you need to be asking yourself. Am I prepared to be the sheepdog? Am I going to be the one who does that? Andreas Overweg, a lean maniac from the Netherlands who was one of the people who helped me edit this book, has made an excellent video illustrating the sheepdog principle while he was on holiday here in Ireland. Have a look at it. Every single exceptional lean culture company needs at least one lean leader, or put alternatively, a lean zealot. A person who gets excited about the smallest improvement and enjoys celebrating that, yet is always positively dissatisfied, looking for improvement opportunities. The lean zealot will be the one who loses sleep if lean isn't going well, and he will never, ever give up. They have made that 100% personal commitment. Paul Akers calls these people the 2%. Those who truly get lean. This person is the one who says, great, now what? Challenging the organization to ever greater heights. That person doesn't have to be the owner or the CEO, but it definitely helps. If they aren't occupying that role, they certainly need to have a number two or three position. And for it to be clear to all that the lean culture is the priority and that they have serious authority to make decisions around resources and hiring and firing as a minimum. If that individual has to go running to someone else to approve buying a box of paper clips, it's not a good look. They need organizational credibility. Otherwise, it's another serious iceberg that could put a serious hole in the hull of your lean ship on its journey. When you decide to make a commitment to lean, you are deciding that your company will be doing morning meetings and 3S, sweep, sort, standardize, 
activities every day forever, or at least the foreseeable future. This is not what I call traditional lean, with events and Kaizen events happening sporadically and then everyone gets back to work. I've never seen that breed a truly amazing culture, personally. If lean is not an everyday activity, with quality time given to making it a focus, the continuous improvement culture never takes hold. And like Paul Akers says in his book, makes you feel like you are constantly pushing a train. It's a struggle to even maintain standards, never mind constantly improving them. Still, for many people, this idea of having the guts of an hour a day not focused on making stuff or delivering your service is completely alien. How does that pay for itself? When I did my first lean transformation, it was a serious problem for me as a lean leader to convince the other senior people who were actually the owners of the company that it was a good idea to have their 50 staff stand around for half an hour in this meeting and then another half an hour 3Sing and making improvements. For them, that was easily $700 a day, without a widget being hit. These were hard-nosed people. What's in it for them? Plus, they're busy, with overtime already, to meet customer demand, and we want them to stop making stuff for a half an hour a day? I can tell you, this was not an easy obstacle initially for me. I was lucky, as I often am, when discussing the matter with one of my best friends, Nick Chamaron whom I originally met when he was recruited as the production manager when I was running the factory in France. He is a brilliant leader, production manager and supply chain guy. When I was discussing Two Second Lean with him and telling him about my convincing the team challenge, he said it was easy to understand. What? I said. And then he explained it to me in his very French way. Here is the explanation straight from Nick himself. When Tom explained that he wanted to get the team moving, but it was going to be a difficult task to, to prove that we can invest the time and invest the money, um, my simple answer was, well, it's actually quite easy. The only thing to do is to be 15% more productive in a day, eight-hour shift, which means that the hour you need would be free forever. I'd never thought about it that way, but it's true. And at that organization, we got a 24% productivity improvement within five months. And that was including the lost hour. That was just the start. So making this commitment has logic. It might take a month or two, but it won't be long before that investment has been permanently paid back. You also don't have to do a full hour. Depending on the context, I recommend to my coaching clients currently that they start with 10 or 15 minutes and just see where it goes in terms of adding value for them. Half an hour is required, however, for 3 essing and making those improvements. In most organizations with the physical dimension to their process, it is very rare that we even have to find the whole 45 minutes. Unless there is a constraint such as health and safety, just eliminate end of shift cleaning, which I've seen can be 45 minutes of relaxing time in many companies, where a broom is casually pushed around and there is a proliferation of people running off for smoke breaks. Rarely is there any real management oversight at these times, so stop that completely. Run the machines until the last minute and then clock off. First thing then is the morning meeting for the entire company and 3S improvement time, which includes the cleaning, but this half hour is a whole level of management or team leaders present on the Gamba, coaching, helping, and supporting their people in their cleaning and improvement activities. So even this commitment is rarely le maire à boire, as my French buddy would say. This means it's not the sea to drink. So far, we have focused on the why of commitment for decision makers, the people at the higher end of an organization chart. However, for Lean to work, everyone in the organization needs to have a genuine, personal reason to engage with it, an actual benefit that will accrue to them personally, the WIFM. That means, what's in it for me? This came up quite by accident when I was visiting my first consultant client company meeting. 
The managing director was giving a State of the Union address, supported by other members of the leadership team. I wasn't expecting to be introduced or asked to speak, but it happened. I was put on the spot and pulled right out of my comfort zone. After a short introduction, I launched into a series of questions to the audience and asked them to raise their hands and keep them raised if the answer was yes. I asked these questions. Who would like less stress in their day-to-day -day work lives? Who would like less friction between departments? Who would like happier customers? Who would like to struggle less every day? As this went on, more and more hands went up and stayed up. My objective was to get the entire room with raised hands. My final question was, who would like to make more money? <laughs> who would like to be tapping their steering wheel, driving here because it's such a great place to work? There was a great atmosphere in the room, and when all hands were raised, I said, brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Every single one of us now has a reason to want to do lean. All very, I'm Spartacus. You'll know what I mean if you've seen the classic movie by Kirk Douglas. But especially in these early days, we need signals to the organization that things are changing and that this is serious. Just as a fun note, if I'd kept asking questions and was still getting one or two hands staying down, my last question was going to be, do you want to work here? And if they'd still kept their hands down, I'd have asked them to leave. Perhaps not very ceremoniously. That would take us back to candor again. As we draw to a close on the commitment chapter, I'd like to point out that for many, verbal and mental commitments are very easy to make. Like at New Year, when we say we're going to give this up or take that up, that new habit or make that change, how many of us actually make it into concrete, real actions that last? Let's just say, not many. We have a few sayings in Lean that apply here. The first comes from Taiichi Ono, who was instrumental in creating the Toyota production system. Some would say he was the father of Lean. The best improvement is the one that you can do right now. Another that helps us along to the same understanding is one I first heard from Paul Aker's company, Fastcap's Lean Principles, but apparently originally came from Winston Churchill. Action. This. Day. So from what we've examined so far in the candor and commitment chapters, what actions are you taking today? So, here are the takeaways from the commitment chapter. The first... Real lean culture starts with I. To be successful, leaders have to be sheepdogs and lead by setting a very high standard of actually practicing lean for it to work. The second, every single person in the organization needs to understand that lean is not about waiting for everyone else to change. It is about all of us as individuals being high level examples. And the third, Lean is not a means to an end, but a vehicle you can use to take your organization wherever you want it to go. And I'm going to go off script here a little bit. I'm going to add two more takeaways that I don't think I made clear enough in the printed book. And that would be number four. If you're going to do this lean thing, the commitment you're making is that lean and culture are going to be your priority and that you're not going to get distracted by anything else. And number five, you're not going to give up. A fantastic lean culture is a great prize, but it's hard work, especially at the beginning. And you need to make your mind up that you're not going to give up at the first, the second, or the third stumbling block. Chapter three. The third C, coaching. A great coach tells you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Sage Kaler. Every organization that successfully implements Two Second Lean has at least one world-class coach within their core team. Often the leader of the company, but not necessarily so. Whether those individuals started their lean journeys as world-class coaches is highly unlikely. Therefore, to grow their respective organizations,
they had to learn to become great coaches along the way. Without a doubt, the best way to develop your coaching skills is by starting to coach yourself. Coaching starts with I. The only problem with that approach is that if you're not naturally gifted and just go at it like a bull in a china shop, you might have a company full of half-broken people within a very short space of time. The biggest pitfall is if you don't fully understand pull versus push and therefore try to manipulate or coerce your people into doing lean, which can irreparably damage the whole lean transformation before it has even started. I had my own set of trials and errors in helping others come on board with lean within my companies where I was a senior leader, but it was only when I started coaching other companies on lean that I was able to develop a very clear and deliberate framework to establish an actual process to get full-on engagement to the lean process. That process has now been tested and will act as a set of stabilizers to help you go about getting your lean implementation off to a good start or provide a basis for you to renew your current efforts if your company has been doing lean for a long time. After all, Everything is a process or the outcome of a process, including how you do lean. The whole idea of me coaching lean with other companies happened completely by accident. It happened because my first two second lean company transformation was an exceptional example, and it received some good publicity in a relatively short space of time. As a result, I was asked to present on the how did we do it at a conference for an important organization. Manufacturing Northern Ireland. I had a real ball doing that. I have enjoyed performing in front of crowds since I was a boy, performing music and playing in bands. In addition, on this occasion, my genuine passion for the subject shone through. I began to garner a good reputation locally in Ireland for seeming to know what I was doing in the space. However, Musical differences meant that I parted company with that original organization, although thankfully on good terms with the ownership team. Around this time, the coronavirus was just starting to make an impact, and the whole world seemed to be on lockdown. These were strange times. In a typical Ling Guy fashion, though, I was still seeing struggle everywhere, and a notable one at the time was how local supermarkets were really struggling to make the whole hand sanitizer thing work. It was actually hard to get hold of the stuff at the beginning, and on one visit to my local store, I watched two staff members struggling to decant fluid from one plastic bottle to another, with the liquid going all over the place. Within struggle lies opportunity. So after a short space of time, I found myself working with fellow lean maniac Patrick McGee of Lumen Electronics, another company practicing two-second lean, whom I had visited earlier that year. Patrick and I hit it off and became buddies. We had chatted about if the opportunity ever came up to work on a product together, and here it was. We were developing a sanitizer dispenser. With the help of our other partner, James McGilloway, on mechanical design, we launched the first version in record time, from idea to product in about six weeks. Seriously. I'd already found a great route to market, and we quickly sold over 1,000 of the things to retailers all over the UK and Ireland. Things looked good. But then they started to come back. There were some serious problems on how robust the design was versus the rigors of the application. It wasn't much fun for the next few months with constant field issues, refurbishments and replacements. Still, through the adversity, Patrick and I came to respect each other more and became fast friends. Many would have tried to cut and run or get off the hook because it was truly painful. Not us. Together with James, we developed a Gen 2 version of the product, which is truly world class, being sold all over the world restoring our reputations and making those original customers happy with their purchases. It was something I took very much to heart as I'd never been involved with something that had gone so wrong before. Gen 2 was much more about repaying our customers' faith in us than it was ever about making money. Towards the end of 2020, 
I told Patrick that I intended to go into business coaching as it was something that I just loved doing. When Patrick responded, why don't you do that for us? That initiative turned into Patrick and I deciding to go into partnership in Lumen Electronics together, as our skill sets really complemented each other well. Me for the strategy, commercial management and mechanical stuff, and Patrick being the electronic guru. Both of us are crazy about lean. So we started lifting Lumen to new heights on everything we did. We developed a new strategy of total product management, where we handled cradle to grave product development, from proof of concept through to mass production, from electronics and mechanical, even software development. It's unique for anyone, in Ireland at least, and so far it's working great. While we are forever positively dissatisfied, I really like that phrase by the way, with what is happening at Lumen, it is turning into a shining example of what Lean can do within a small company environment. We even recently hosted the world-renowned AME two-second Lean Tour with Paul Akers and Richard Evans. You can watch that video in the resources or find the link in the description along with all the others. It was a resounding success. We now get customers asking us how they can replicate what they see at our place, which is turning into a source of coaching clients for years truly. And while Lumen is still small, I have time to give to other companies, which is a happy situation. During this time, I also became good buddies with other people in the lean space, like Ryan Tierney. They have companies visiting them for lean tours all the time, and I have been turning into the go-to person for people looking for help. My first proper coaching client was a company called Black Box from Belfast, who make and sell high-end fitness gear. These are the guys I mentioned in the previous chapter. Their managing director, Greg Bradley, is a visionary in the fitness industry who started the company from nothing. They had visited Seating Matters prior to COVID kicking off and got excited about lean, but their lean ambitions were sidelined by the minor distraction of a global pandemic. Now things were calming down on that front, and in the meantime, they had doubled in size and taken a bunch of manufacturing processes in-house that had previously been outsourced. They were looking for some help as things had become somewhat chaotic. Initially, when Greg approached me, he asked for someone to support getting his manufacturing into a better state. I explained that there were probably a dozen people better in Northern Ireland to talk to about that. But if he wanted someone to coach him to build a better lean culture, then I would be really excited about doing that. I'd been previously approached by a large local concrete company with more than a thousand employees to help them build a lean culture. I'd put a lot of work into developing a methodology for them to use, but in the end, I was disappointed when they didn't go for it. Their mountains of waste are highly likely to still be there to this day. I discussed that opportunity with Paul Akers, who in that time had also turned into a friend, mentor, and surrogate father figure to me. But as Paul always reminds me, a very young father. He helped me put that initial framework together, so I was dying to try it out. I was delighted that Greg agreed for me to come and help Black Box become a world-class lean company. The guys were paying me to do this coaching job, but for me it was never about the money. It was always about helping them grow into a world-class organization. My goal was quite contrary to a traditional consultant who wants to get in and get lots of paid days at the company. I wanted to help them get momentum for their lean process to become self-sustaining and then to get out as soon as possible. I am happy to report that this is exactly what happened. The time with Black Box helped me prove this framework and to improve it. To my mind, this framework could work for almost all organizations with or without an external coach like me who has done it before. Personally though, I recommend going the external coach route. Someone like myself who has done it multiple times certainly does help avoid some of the hard pitfalls that are created by soft issues. Boy, I really hate that term. <laughs> soft issues are, not can be, the difference between bad and outstanding. The soft issues are about leadership, skillful management and culture building. They are the foundations and cause for the hard numbers. 
whether those numbers are bad or exceptionally good. My initial discussions with Greg had a lot to do with the candor and commitment chapters we have already covered. As an external coach, it was critical to me that my role was well defined. I was here to advise, cajole, and support, but not to lift those weights. Only the leadership team could do that. There are several critical advantages that an external coach has over just using an internal resource. The first is that the external coach provides a new set of eyes, a fresh perspective to the organization. Some of those less than smart practices, like the non productive meetings that everyone has got used to but no one speaks up about, or the management team member with the bad attitude that everyone else has learned to just put up with. The external coach can spot the obvious and surface those issues to leadership. It often provokes them into action where even they had become comfortable with the dysfunction before. It's even better when the external coach has broad and deep experience to provide a good mirror, especially when the leaders have spent a long time immersed in a single organization. This is especially true in an owner-grown company, where the leader has not been heavily exposed to best practices from other organizations or other sectors. The external coach can provide a great stimulus to look at things in a different way. The external coach gets to call things as they see them without being perceived as being partisan in any way. It's harder for an internal person to do that without being seen as having personal baggage or them being fearful about upsetting people too much when things that are difficult need to be said, especially when that communication is to the top management. A great external coach can be a conciliary. The last thing you want is a consultant. With Greg, I put together a roadmap on how I would support the team to get up and running. It was going to take four to six weeks before we would start the morning meetings. And these were the key steps in the run-up to that. Step one, who will be the Ryan? You might ask, what does that mean? The answer is simple. From observing companies all over the world, and especially the ones that have done lean right, it's evident that at every company, there is a clear leader for lean. Whether that be Ryan Tierney at Seating Matters, that's why I use the term Ryan here, Paul Akers at FastCap, or my friend Brannon Burton at Sunrock Corporation, there is always a clear and visible lean leader. Now they are always supported by some other exceptional lean leaders who have developed alongside those guys. But there is always someone clear at the top who is clearly accountable for the whole culture and its effectiveness. Very few things are done well by committee. So saying we are all accountable simply doesn't work. No one person is lying awake at night wondering what to do when lean hits a rocky patch or is lying awake excited with a new idea to try out to make things even better. There simply has to be a single individual, a linchpin, holding the whole thing together. At Black Box, the Ryan was agreed to be a chap called Peter McCauley, who was head of manufacturing. Peter was a senior member of the leadership team and had a passion for lean and developing people. He was an ideal choice. He had the clear and visible support of Greg and the other senior leaders within the team. Step 2. Establish a learning club. The objective of the learning club is to get the senior team practicing lean on a daily basis themselves. I can't emphasize that enough. Themselves. <laughs> Within their sphere of influence and starting to pull, not push, their teams on board. We want to turn this group into a team of internal coaches. The idea is to create a magnet of excitement and excellence that gets other people curious about what is happening. Curiosity was something I was learning about at the time through someone I knew who had a child with autism, specifically a condition called PDA, pathological demand avoidance. Children with this condition cannot deal with the traditional school system 
Reacting badly to any kind of order, demand, or even a request, it pushes them into anxiety and they can react in all kinds of ways, few of them particularly positive. No kind of traditional carrot and stick type of parenting works. I listened to an expert talk on the subject and he said the key to learning for PDA people was curiosity. If curiosity can be created, a space is made for learning to happen. It occurred to me that this was not just for people with PDA. It's true for all of us. Many of us have crammed for an academic examination that we just needed to pass with written learning only to forget it all after a few days. However, if the topic of learning is something we are genuinely curious about, it becomes an automatic, self-motivated process. This is key and one of the most important factors in creating poll. The Learning Club helps set new expectations at an early stage. Everyone has to make improvements and get on board as we set the tone with the leadership team for how lean is done. This is not just the traditional top-down management commitment that translates in most organizations to the senior management just supporting the rest of the company to do it, but not actually doing it themselves. This is how most organization change initiatives are pushed into a company and has been the normal modus operandus for decades. It's also why the vast majority of organizational change initiatives fail to get traction or sustain. When you step back and look at this normal way of doing things, it fails because it's hypocritical. Do as I say, not as I do. This point cannot be emphasized enough. Everyone especially senior leaders, needs to stop being carpet walkers. In a manufacturing environment, that means getting your hands dirty by getting out onto the shop floor where the work is done. Regularly. Every single day. Paul Akers recently responded to a bunch of senior executives from a multi-billion dollar company who asked him what the most important thing they could do to implement lean was by telling them to get their heads out of their asses and get onto the shop floor and work side by side with their people. Not what those guys are used to hearing. For those not in manufacturing departments or whose businesses don't make anything, it just means rolling up your sleeves and getting into the trenches where the value is created with your people. As well as being simply the right thing to do, it also helps get momentum going as the changes are visible and other people start to wonder about what is going on with this Lean Club thing. Curiosity starts to be created. My ambition with Learning Club at Black Box was that people who were not originally in the club would ask to join it to create that poll. I'm happy to say that this is exactly what happened. Two others had asked to join by week three. Step 2.1, the logistics of setting up a leadership learning club. Now let's look at how we structured the learning club. We needed to select between six and 10 people from the senior team, directors, managers, supervisors, and or influencers who would be taking part. By influencers, I mean just those people within your organization that other people look up to and follow. So we would have a kickoff meeting with the team to deliver clarity for all on the objectives and the methodology that we were adopting. Everyone needed to read or listen to the Two Second Lean book over a four week period. Here is the app I was telling you about that can help with that, the Lean Play app. You can find a link to it in the resources or in the description of the video. The next step was to create a WhatsApp group for sharing, learning, and improvements. Then each Friday afternoon, we would hold two to three hour learning club meetings to discuss that section of the book and show improvements that individuals had made. 
We would generally look at a couple of supplementary videos on the key points, but certainly not death by PowerPoint. This would not just be classroom based, but going out into the workplace to learn to see waste and get working on it. Step 2.2 Learning Club Content. The three big concepts we focused on in the Learning Club were building a lean culture is all about pull, not push. Improvement starts with I. Next, Lean is about growing and developing people. And finally, Lean Done Right is about repetition and total participation. We used the Two Second Lean book as the backbone for the Learning Club, discussing the content each week. The additional key content, especially regarding what the internal coaches needed to do, is outlined in Section 2.4. We'll come to that soon. Next, step 2.3, establish a lean cave. During this time, I'd become friendly with Alex Ramirez, he's from the Candor chapter, through the amazing Lean Maniac Signal Group run by Dave Lalonic of Sticky RX. This book sounds like a name dropping pamphlet for all the best lean companies in the world, but that is how the lean community works. Some of us have never even met especially because of COVID, but there are a fast bunch of friends who learn and grow together. Alex had led what, in my opinion, was the best two-second lean implementation in the world of 2020. When I was embarking on the black box consultancy gig, I'd consulted with Alex about the things he felt were key success factors within his strategy. In his opinion, the lean cave was one of the critical facilitation tools. So a Lean Cave is a collection of the tools and materials that people need when they start to make improvements. We make it easy for them to get going. Things like Kaizen foam, knives to work with the foam, floor tape, markers, and so on. Alex's Lean Cave is like a high-end hardware store, but for many, it can be a lot simpler than that. Like many of the best ideas, it seems so obvious, after someone else has come up with it, that is. Creating a lean cave helps create and maintain momentum. All the important tools and materials are there to make improvements right now. The team doesn't have to ask for them or wait for them to arrive. Action this day becomes real from the very early days of lean. And even if your company is already doing lean, I would say that it's never too late to create a lean cave. Alex told me recently that the people at one of the new plants implementing Two Second Lean described the lean cave as being like the bottom of a Christmas tree. They would see what was there and the tools and materials stimulated ideas as to how they could be used to make life easier. So it works both ways. The lean cave facilitates improvement ideas to come into reality but the items in the Lean Cave also stimulate new ideas. It's so obvious when it's pointed out. Just do it. Step 2.4, the external coach getting to know Black Box. For myself to play a full role, I could not just have observational knowledge. I would need to spend one to two days a week, at least a week before and during the Learning Club stage, hands-on working in the production areas and understanding what is happening in the administration and engineering areas. This was to get a proper ground-level feel of the existing culture, issues and challenges so that I could speak from a position of experience rather than hearsay when interacting with the entire team and potentially making important change recommendations to the senior team for consideration. Whether or not you bring in an external coach, it is super important for the Ryan and his senior supporters to have proper on the ground, on the Gemba, knowledge about how things are actually happening within the organization. Here's a personal story just to illustrate the importance of ground level knowledge, especially for a business leader. Before I was consciously using Lean as an organizational transformation methodology, I was brought in to run a factory in France. 
At the time, my French was almost non-existent, and I was somewhat daunted by the prospect. There were some industrial relations issues still to be resolved in the turnaround, and I'd never run a factory before, never mind in a foreign country where I didn't speak the language properly, like France. Before taking the role, I insisted on spending two weeks on the shop floor, building products with the guys. This had never happened before. It's not unfair to say that France's business culture can be a little stuffy, and senior people just simply don't do things like this. I know that most of the middle management team that would be reporting to me thought I was a crazy Irishman, and in many ways I wouldn't argue with that analysis. My initial briefing from the London-based ownership team was that France had a very difficult bunch of people working there. Typical lazy French, with bad attitudes. That was the problem. They would love to have closed the facility down and moved it to Eastern Europe for cost savings, but due to those pesky frogs' labour regulations, that would have cost a fortune, so they just had to put up with it. Anyhow. My two weeks were highly illuminating. I discovered an absolutely amazing bunch of people who just wanted to turn up to work, do a good job that they could be proud of, be shown some respect, and go home. I've since discovered that this is true for every single nationality on the planet. Lean never goes wrong because of the shop floor, and I mean ever. It only ever goes wrong because of crappy management and lack of leadership. Please don't forget that. The real problem was at the middle management level, they basically all hated each other, and therefore the different departments struggled to work together cohesively. The previous production manager hated the technical manager, who hated the quality manager, and who in turn hated the production and the technical managers. As they say in France, it was a bordel, or a connerie. You can look up those words if you like, the answers aren't pleasant. Sales were under a different director, and those guys just had to put up with the bad performance. We were already bringing a stellar production manager in my friend Nick Jamerol into the organisation, and it didn't take long to move out the quality and technical managers and replace them with better. Change the people or change the people. The thing is, without my time on the Gemba, it might have taken me a lot longer to realise what the real trouble was. Without the on the ground knowledge, I could still have been working under the assumption that the problem was in the shop. As a leader, you need to work from knowledge, not assumptions. You can't coach people if you don't understand the environment. Never be too good to go on the Gemba and get your hands dirty. Taichi Ono had a famous practice called Ono's Circle, where he would chalk out a circle on the floor and instruct the manager to stay there for hours while they observed the process. Real first-hand information, not data, not a report, real observed data. Go to the problem, don't try to solve it from your desk. I was out of France within 18 months and under the amazing stewardship of Nick and the late Monsieur Christian Le Cossier, it eventually went on to become the jewel in the crown of our company, Olaire. It was our R&D centre, our centre of excellence for volume manufacture, and being in Paris didn't hurt either when it came to taking customers and important stakeholders to a place where they could be impressed. Literally for the remaining time that I spent at Olaire, going there pretty much every month was like a vacation. I loved the place, and the people, so much. At Black Box, my Gamba time helped me to see that, like most pre-lean organisations, there were mountains of waste, some interdepartmental frictions due to personalities, and conflicting key performance indicators, Intimately learning this is absolutely key for the lead coach. Like always, there were also some change the people or change the people issues that I had to surface. All very normal. All opportunities to improve through changing the culture to lean. Step 2.4.1 Learning Club Content The Detail 
The target was to build a strong team of internal coaches so that we would have a strong support organization when we started to roll out the morning meetings and improvement times. We used the Two Second Lean book as the basis for the club, taking chunks of the content and discussing them to emphasize the key points. I really recommend that you check out the links to the Learning Club presentations. You can find them in the video description or in the resource section of the app. So week one, when I was doing this at Black Box, was very much an introduction to myself, my own lean journey, and what lean is, and what it is not, together with what our roadmap looked like over the coming weeks. I made a big point about how I used to perceive lean, versus what I actually now know lean to be. Pull not push, growing people, and repetition and total participation. This is particularly useful to get in early because many people in our organizations have had bad experiences of what I call corporate lean from other places where they've worked, especially larger ones. We certainly had this issue at Black Box. This leads people to a place of complacency and in some cases of arrogance with a I know what lean is attitude. We need to knock that on the head straight away. Whatever the Tim Woods, that's an acronym consultants use to help people memorize the eight wastes that you might have learnt in your old place, unless it had total participation, this is completely different. We're all doing this every day, not the traditional top few. Our focus is on engagement, not the key performance indicators, the flip charts, or the dry workshops. It's not about everyone else improving. It's all about you improving and leading by example. This early introduction covered the basic system of Two Second Lean, which is in three parts. First, the morning meeting, where we build culture and learn to see waste together. We use it to set expectations for everyone. We all need to make one two second improvement every day. Second, 3S. Sweep, sort, standardize. Improvement time, where we all have the opportunity to apply our learning in our workplaces and processes and posting our improvements in our WhatsApp group. Third, reinforce the expectation in the morning meeting the following day by celebrating our improvements and deepening our understanding of waste to keep the improvement cycle going. It's a cycle. It's a process. And because it's a process, we should always look at how it can be improved. Week two, two second lean, first section, chapters one to six. We begin by reviewing the three big concepts again, pull not push, growing people, repetition and total participation. This isn't an accident. I want the guys to experience that. I want them to ask themselves, why are we doing this again? Then it's funny when I test them about who remembers and to see how few of them do. It's much better to learn through doing than just by seeing and listening. Then we discuss the chapters one by one as a group. A lot of the key principles show themselves in the early stages of the book. I used to think that chapter one, what is lean of two second lean, was a bit of a waste of time, to be honest. At first glance, it appears that it is just setting the scene for what is to come. However, when one looks deeper, it's like the before of the before and after, which is a critical concept in Lean, and one that we very much use to motivate each other by posting those before and afters in our WhatsApp groups. Done right, it really is the petrol on the fire of your Lean culture. This chapter describes Paul being happy in his ignorance. His young company is doing well, the bank loves him. In his view, he just needs to tweak a few things, like his inventory management system. It's only when Tracy delivers the immortal line, you don't know what you're doing, that he gets the wake-up call. The truth of the matter is that most company leaders would not listen. Why do I say that? Because most businesses are average comfortable in their dysfunction. The leaders are either too arrogant, 
and think they know it all, so they don't think there is a better way. Ignorant of the fact that things can really be different. Scared to make a big change because they are not confident in their own ability. Or they aren't motivated enough to change because they just want a lifestyle business. That's a challenge to your company's leadership team. Where are you within this spectrum? Will you be one of the minority? For chapters two and three, you mean I'm really that bad? We ran a game with three teams putting a coloured sticker on a piece of A4 paper, folding it, putting it into an envelope and writing invoice on the finished product and handing it to a customer. One team of four batched each step. Another team of four used single piece flow. A third team of one person used a single operator U-shaped cell. We ran this as a race to see which was most effective. Perhaps you can guess who finished first? Try it out and discover for yourself. For chapter four, it only gets better from here. We majored on the principles of value and non-value added with a brilliant video by Brad Cairns of Best Damn Doors fame, which illustrates this principle perfectly. You can find the link in the resources or in the description. Simply put, it's only value added if there is a physical transformation or something that the customer is willing to pay for. Everything else is simply shades of waste if it's something the customer is not willing to pay for or the company would rather be doing less of it. Brad is zealous in his rigorous view of black and white waste. And while it's debatable if that is strictly correct, my personal view is that it's a lot better to start from that place than come up with all the excuses under the sun as to why your waste is okay rather than just reducing it. Or better still, getting rid of it. I used other videos by Ryan Tierney and Hugh Carnahan to further deepen the understanding of this concept that are also included. We're going to hear the clip from the Hugh video right here because it's just so good. It's so impactful. Here we go. You've ever had, period. Right? Do you agree? Yeah. Check this out. Check this out, ready? Tell ready? me shot, yeah. Go. No value added. 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 Value added. No 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 value added. Value added. No value added. Oh, defect. For chapter four, we also go into the eight wastes and use this opportunity to banish Tim Wood. Many companies, especially the large ones using consultants, like to teach their people about the waste by using acronyms. So the Tim Wood acronym goes as follows. T for transportation, I for inventory, M for motion, W for waiting, O for overprocessing, O for overproduction, and D for defects. There's also an alternative with a similar end result called downtime. That one goes like this. D is for defects, O is for overproduction, W is waiting, N is not using talent, T, transportation, I for inventory, M for motion, and E for extra processing. A few of the guys in our group were in the We Know Lean camp. It was fun playing a video of Mr. Akers slating the use of acronyms because they do not promote understanding, just rote learning. There is no depth to this. You can find that video in the links. Instead, we started coaching people to tell stories about waste. Paul had done a recent podcast that was very timely on the matter. He talked about having friends over for dinner, but they weren't sure how many were coming, so they made too much salad. Overproduction. The mother of all wastes, as you'll see. So they had to put the leftover salad in a box. Motion. Which was then put into the fridge. Transportation and excess inventory. After a few days, the salad didn't get used, so it went off. Defects, which then meant it had to go into the trash, scraping out the container. Extra processing. Meanwhile, Paul's wife Leanne is waiting for him to come to the sofa and give her a cuddle. 
not using talent, her talent. I ad libbed the last piece there, but you get the picture. Sorry, Leanne. It's getting everyone to understand the story of waste, and with time, the story of waste within their own span of control, the work they do that really matters. And don't forget, acronyms suck. Chapter 5 introduces the concept of fix what bugs you. This is one of the most powerful concepts in the book. It's the simplicity that is so beautiful. No charts, graphs, or complicated analytics. If it's annoying you, do something about it. My example here, where Paul helps to put on my light bulb about struggle. Again, the video's in the links. Got wheeled out here for the guys. If there's a struggle or things are bunching up, you're probably not doing it right. Time for an improvement. Chapter 6 speaks about the VP of Lexus, who gave Paul his Satori method of lean being all about the people, not the processes first. Grow the people, focus on that, and the rest follows. As you can probably imagine, this was quite an intense afternoon. Week 3 of Learning Club Two Second Lean, Second Section, Chapters 7 to 11. We always begin the Learning Club by reviewing all the key points from the previous week. We're not joking when we say repetition is key to learning. And it's fun seeing the penny drop with the team that just because someone has been told hardly ever works without repetition. This is so important to reinforce with our internal coaches. Through experience, Learning that telling once or twice rarely ever works. You may have noticed the repetition in the third key concept of Learning Club of repetition and total participation, and wondering what that's about. Lean is simple. However, there is a but, and that but is that lean is also very deep. Let's take the eight wastes. In an ordinary traditional lean implementation, People may be subjected to a day or two of formal training around the eight wastes, if they're lucky. Then the company plasters the notice boards and shop floor walls with big signs proclaiming the Timwood or what other shallow proclamation they want. And that's the training complete for the people. They know what the eight wastes are, right? Wrong. They might know of the eight wastes, but they don't know the eight wastes. As you know, I love my spirituality and consider myself half Hindu, even though I'm from a farm in County Derry in Northern Ireland. Hardly a hotbed of followers of the guru. I love this story though about an Indian guru, Sri Yukteswar, who was asked by someone trying to test his knowledge of the scriptures. The rude protagonist asked, do you know the Bhagavad Gita? That's the Hindu Bible. To which Yukteswar answered, I have read it more than a hundred times, but no, I do not know it. That is how I see lean. And that is the attitude you need to adopt as a coach. Putting the signs up does not mean you've trained people, and certainly not that they understand it. That is done by repetition, and when done right, creative repetition. It's not enough to simply put people on the spot and ask them to recite the eight wastes or even tell the story of the wastes. The training that is delivered in the morning meeting needs to look at the eight wastes repeatedly, but from different angles. There are dozens of different ways to look at excess motion, for example, and the things that cause it. The skill of the people running the morning meeting is to find ways to repeat but not get boring. That can never happen. So on to the new stuff. Paul's visit to Hawks and his Satori moment is one of the focus areas for this week. I am fortunate enough to be able to share my own personal experience of having visited Hawks and what a truly exceptional operation they have. There are lots of links to videos about this one. To be present while all the people from that company are doing their 3S is such an inspirational experience. The level of energy they exhibit is nothing short of maniacal. Everyone gives it their all, including the owner of the $40 million company, 
who is energetically cleaning the windows outside the reception area. They even have a team of people cleaning the street outside the factory. It's insane. Hawks is the place where 5S, traditional lean, through the art of subtraction became 3S. Set in order gets brought into standardize and sustain, which is usually the hardest part in traditional lean to keep it going, is thrown out because we don't have to worry about that with our approach as we are doing it every day. When I teach 3S myself, I break it down into subgroups to help people understand what is behind each S and so that they can coach others. Sweep, for example, is clean, identify problems, and raise the standard. Let's talk about clean first. One of the most common misconceptions, even by people who have been doing lean for a long time, is viewing clean as a low-level activity. For them, it's like the thing people do when they aren't smart enough to come up with an improvement. Without sugarcoating it, that is sometimes the case, but it's definitely not always. Personally, I was convinced that it's not just pushing a broom around. I followed up on this hunch by asking the question, why do we clean every day? in the Lean Maniac Signal Group run by Dave Lelonic. In my experience, the best group in the world. I received some truly inspirational answers, and here are just some of them. So why do we clean? Respect for yourself. Respect for others. Respect for your work area. To banish sloppiness, a great work environment leads to great work. To minimize distractions and focus on the work, or a clean and clear work environment is a form of visual management that reveals abnormalities and opportunities for improvement. Next, cleaning helps us raise our standards every day. Cleaning creates ownership of the space. When every single person cleans, it shows that we are all in this together. When we boil all of these answers down, I would summarize it in three words. Cleaning builds culture. So never let anyone say they were just pushing a broom around. The guy who is just pushing the broom around is taking ownership of his area, respecting himself, others, and his work. He is buying into the culture. It shows that he is engaged. Your internal coaches especially need to get this. People get lean at different speeds, some straight away and some take months. I've seen guys who have been sweepers for months and then they make one small improvement, the simplest thing like finding a home for the broom or the cleaning materials. When they receive some encouragement and recognition, it kindles the spark and they get it some more. Keep it up and they get to be on fire with the rest of the team. This all requires patience, empathy, and emotional intelligence, all attributes of the lean leader and the lean coach. So the next step in my definition of sweep is identify problems. I had a phrase that I used in my first lean transformation, you don't just sweep with the broom, you sweep with your head as well. As time goes on, we are looking for the source of the dirt. After all, cleaning in itself is a non-value-added activity. Yes, I know here's another dichotomy within lean, but it's true. So we want to find ways to reduce dirt being generated, where it is coming from, and how it spreads. Most factories that I've seen are full of improvement opportunities in these areas. When you clean the entire work area, you identify things that are anomalous. Should that X be there? Why is Y not there? This is the start of a problem-solving process which generates improvements. The next part of my sweep definition is raise the standard. When you see the lengths that hawks go to with cleaning, literally toothbrushing the floor to get rid of stains, you can also start to understand that cleaning is also a form of continuous improvement. When people start on their lean journeys, 
Many are just getting rid of dirt. To quote Ryan Tierney, they use snow shovels once a week to clean the place. As the improvement effort starts to take hold, it's not just sweeping to the same standard as last month or last year. As the regular cleaning process takes hold, people want to make it better. So, leave it better than you found it is just such a powerful phrase. Not only does it foster respect for each other by not expecting someone else to clean up your mess, but it also asks us not to leave it the same as we found it, but better. When this beds into your culture and is reinforced by good coaching, it naturally leads to continuous improvement because the bar is constantly being raised. Chapters 8 to 11 and the WhatsApp exercise. These chapters outline the bare bones of what I consider the system of Two Second Lean, the morning meeting, the 3S improvement time, and the reinforcement of behavior with celebrating success back in the morning meeting from the improvements we posted in the WhatsApp group the day before. I must say, I've never felt better in my entire career than when I was coaching improvement time in my first transformation project. The energy was just incredible. I get such a kick out of watching people come out of themselves. Of course there are people who get it at the start, and those people never stop getting it. Each day when you as a leader coach make your rounds, it's such a joy to see today's improvement or how they are making progress on a big improvement that is chipped away one half hour at a time. Often with guys from all different departments helping out. That is one of the surprise benefits of Two Second Lean. Few of the larger improvements that emerge are done by a single person on their own. More often than not, they elicit support from other people in the team to make it happen. For example, someone who works on a pipe bending machine would ask the guy on the laser cutting machine to cut him a sheet of metal. He'd get help from the guy on the press break to get it bent. Then he'd have to get a guy to weld it for him. Then it needs painting. The guy who looked after the paint shop spent most of his improvement time doing work for other people's improvements. The whole thing just greases the joints between people and different departments. It builds teams. The before and afters are also a big part of celebrating those achievements. I describe them as the petrol on your lean fire. It's critical that your coaches constantly celebrate and encourage. So, so far in Learning Club, we had some engagement in the WhatsApp group. Usual early adopters posting their stuff. It was good, but not great. I wanted these guys to feel what great looked like. They'd never had an improvement time before, or even a proper morning meeting yet. So I ran a little coaching experiment. Here we go. Right, people. You each have 20 minutes to go to your personal workspace and either 3S it or make an improvement. And I need a before and after from every single one of you posted in the WhatsApp group and we'll give a prize for the best one. Videos earn extra points over photographs. Now, off you go. Now, this could have been a disaster, like all these first-time experiments, but it really didn't work out like that. I was waiting back in the meeting room, and within 15 minutes, WhatsApp was pinging like anything. Sure enough, in 20 minutes, the 12 people were back in the room, a little breathless and full of energy. The room felt amazing, but that wasn't it. I didn't have time to make a video or compile what the guys had done. I hadn't even thought of that. So my in-the-moment solution was just to scroll through the media section in WhatsApp, live off of my laptop. So off we went. For most people, it was their first time making a video that non-family members would see. Most guys did a voiceover and did a good-humoured job of explaining what they did, just pointing the camera at their work. Even for those, everyone was laughing, cheering and clapping at every after. One big thing we noticed was how much more people engaged with videos that had someone's face in them. They definitely got the biggest cheers and by far the biggest reaction. This simple exercise was definitely the kickstart of momentum for this team. 
There's a great quote that captures this. People will forget what you say. They will forget what you did. But they will never forget how you made them feel. Maya Angelou. This says a lot about what real engagement is about, fostered by good coaching. As we have already discovered, real lean is not about the charts and graphs. It's about hearts and minds. In that order, engagement is built, maintained, and grown from the hearts of the leaders to build a solid community of people who give to each other. If your engagement is waning, it's not because you're not connecting with people's heads. It's because you're not connecting with people's hearts. And that connection always starts with the leader having an open heart. It virtually never happens the other way around. It always starts at the top. I'm going to get a bit spiritual for a moment. You can't have an open heart if you're all tense about manipulating people to do what you want them to do. Or you've got an energy of frustration and anger about people or things not going your way. As always, improvement starts with I. And it always starts with the leadership team giving and getting that cycle going. Getting things unstuck. I remember at one company where I was leading the transformation, when I was encouraging the management team to make a lot of changes, I categorized them into the not doing stupid stuff camp of things to be doing. Things like giving people a hard time, really treating grown adults like naughty children when they were changing safety gloves because they were expensive, cleaning up and decorating the works canteen not to be a totally horrible and depressing place to eat your lunch, skimping on tools and maintenance, basic things like that, not high-level stuff. I got pushed back because I was told, you're always just wanting to give them stuff. What about them giving to us? Unfortunately, in my experience, it simply does not work like that. If you want to break a cycle of behavior or start a more virtuous one, it has to start with management making the change. And that means management opening their hearts and giving. It also might take a little while before the return is evident. These things need to be done in the spirit of just being the right thing to do. My buddy Alex calls this the circle of trust. Management makes a move, the shop responds. Management takes another move, the shop does more. Trust spirals upwards. That's how it works. Now, back to WhatsApp. This exercise provided instant recognition for the gifts of the improvement before and after pictures and videos that people had made. They got to experience their colleagues laughing, smiling, and celebrating their achievements. It sets things on fire. That's what happens when you get it right. I often think that people can rarely put themselves in the shoes of another. It's especially important as a coach. Think about it. You're a new starter or a junior member of staff and you go to the morning meeting. These big people tell you that they want you to make improvements and post in the company WhatsApp group. So after a week or two, you get the courage to make a post. It took guts for you to do that. You make the post and the reaction is tumbleweed. No one thanks you. How would you feel about that? How about if you made another improvement, another video, even after you received zero recognition for the first one? How would you feel then? This stuff isn't rocket science. So the lesson we need to hear in this instance, that 100% needs to be built into your two-second lean routine, is where you will make sure that every single improvement contribution is recognized and that the really above and beyond contributions are truly full-on celebrated. That team from Learning Club are core in driving things forward in these early weeks. They were going to be the first leaders of the morning meeting, and just as importantly, were going to be the 12 Apostles of Lean. We made it clear that they were the ones who were going to build momentum in the WhatsApp group, 
setting the tone by making improvements themselves and coaching their respective teams to get going with their improvement efforts. So week four of Learning Club, where we really focused on explaining what triple X leadership means. We've touched on triple X in the candor chapter, but we'll go into it in more depth here. The first point is super important. The more senior the person, the more important it is that they take this on board. Triple X stands for Extraordinary Exceptional Example. There's a great video by Paul Akers on this subject. Please check it out. Our learning club coaches must exhibit triple X by taking the lead, making the improvements, coaching the team, and posting to the WhatsApp group every single day, at least once, and they need to encourage their people. The triple X leader always shows appreciation for other people's efforts. They thank people face to face and on WhatsApp. They celebrate them in the morning meeting and they get excited about other people's improvements. I'm lucky here that I naturally get really excited by the smallest improvements that people in the team make. Some of the ones that have touched me personally would not seem that great to someone else. Things like the first improvement that someone with very poor English, who has been super quiet makes, like mounting a broom on his workstation. It might not seem like rocket science, not an Instagram improvement, but it shows that this person is engaging. It shows that he wants to get involved and do better. To say it again, at these early stages, the improvements don't matter. Engaging people does. Another skill that the lean leader or internal coach needs to develop is the art of deflection. This is not like the normal corporate BS world where everyone tries to take credit for everything, regardless of whether they did it or not. I had an old boss who used to say, success has many fathers, but failure is an orphan. In another toxic organization, someone actually presented my department's improvement work and results as their own, not realizing I was in the room. In a lean company, especially as a triple X leader, it's the opposite of that. Try to give the credit to others and take less of the credit yourself. I'm not saying to lie, but be magnanimous about how credit is distributed. Deflect it, if possible, onto someone else in the wider team, especially to newer, less senior members. Now all of that is a high bar, but why allow that bar to be any lower? This is such an important point for leader coaches to understand. Lean only ever fails because the leaders are not consistently triple X, coming from the heart and therefore not setting the engagement that it all stems from. If your lean process is having problems, the first place to look as leader coaches is in the mirror. The next triple X point is to never say no. Support, encourage, and listen. You might think this is crazy, but it's so important, especially in the early days of Two Second Lean. I've seen awful leaders pour cold water on the embryonic ideas of a team member, and it's one of the fastest ways to kill your lean culture. Unless someone's idea will negatively impact safety or quality, or incur a big expenditure that is more than likely going to be a waste, encourage everyone's ideas, even if you, as a coach, have a much better idea. The most important thing, especially in these early days, is that everyone's ideas are welcomed and as far as possible taken on board. I've watched so-called leaders, um and ah, when a team member is being an enthusiastic puppy full of improvement ideas, only to have their good energy dashed because it's not quite perfect, or more importantly, not perfect enough in the leader's eyes. So yes, two of the other lines on the exceptional, extraordinary leader slide are mistakes will happen, and growing people is more important than improvements. Engaging and building it is the main objective. With skillful nurturing, improvements will always follow. It's a marathon, 
not a sprint. Next point on exceptional, extraordinary leader is to keep to your own individual span of control. It's another common issue when an organization starts on the road of two second lean is that some people want everyone else to improve apart from them. So when a coach makes their rounds on the Gemba during improvement time, which is one of their most important tasks, is that they receive improvement suggestions like, hey, why don't we change the ERP system? That's the enterprise resource planning system that the entire company is run on. And then my life would be easier. Why don't we buy a new XYZ multi-million dollar thing? Then everything would be better. One important task of the coach is to bring the individual's attention down to their own span of control. Fix what bugs you and what you have the power right now to change. That is what our expectation is and bring them back to that. It's not that we won't fix or change the big stuff. It's just that it is not where the focus is right now. Let's get the team to show what great improvements we can make right now. And as we do that more and more, the company will get more confidence to back bigger changes and make more investments to make improvements happen. Now, it was time to get this thing going. With our Black Box Learning Club, this was the last weekly session before we would get going with Lean Proper, and this meant starting the morning meetings. We continued with Learning Club for another few weeks the content of which shall be discussed in the concluding chapter, Consistency. So, the takeaways from the coaching chapter. Number one, all truly great lean organizations have great coaches at their head. Number two, coaching is best learnt by doing. Number three, A learning club provides a great platform to grow your internal coaches and set expectations. Number four, and this is the most important one. Lean never goes wrong on the shop floor. It's always a leadership problem. Chapter four, the fourth C, consistency. Success is neither magical nor mysterious. Success is the natural consequence of consistently applying basic fundamentals. E. James Rowe. There are so many K words that I could have chosen for this chapter. Kata, which means routine in Japanese. Kaizam, which in Japanese means small steps of continuous improvement. And continuous improvement as a term in itself but I settled for consistency. I chose that word deliberately because it's not very glamorous. Consistency could sound like the boring part of the lean recipe, the rinse and repeat part, but it cannot be left out. And providing the other C's are being dealt with, it's where the engagement is built. Improvement happens and results are delivered. Consistency in this sense is about putting one foot in front of the other. I climbed Kilimanjaro in 2014, and it was by far the toughest physical challenge I've ever taken on. We hiked for 12 plus hours a day, for five days, never got more than a few hours sleep every night due to the freezing temperatures, and I had to wear the same basic clothes for the last couple of days due to my gear getting wet and with no way of drying it. It was hard. On summit morning, we had to get up at 3 a.m. in the dark and hike up to the top to be there in time for sunrise. It was also by far the coldest temperature we had to hike in because it was the middle of the night and the highest altitude. The water froze in my drinking bottle inside my backpack because it was so cold. I was absolutely exhausted due to the lack of sleep and the previous five days' exertions. It was a pretty miserable period, I can tell you. The only thing that got me through it was literally the concept of one step at a time. I didn't worry about the next four or five hours of effort it would take to get to the top. I just focused on taking each single individual step. 
that wasn't too hard. Anything beyond that, and it would have seemed insurmountable. It could have made me give up. So no, I just took one step at a time, and I made it. My Houston buddy, Alex Ramirez, inadvertently provided me with some similar inspiration while he was playing tennis against someone much younger and fitter than him. When they first started playing each other, he was always losing. He was always looking for the fancy killer shot to catch his adversary off guard. However, as soon as he just started simply focusing on getting the ball over the net, just being simple and consistent, he started to win all the time. In Alex's words, you don't need to be a hero. Just do the simple stuff consistently. That's what this consistency chapter is about. Building up a consistent routine that constantly evolves, but never gets missed within your organization that works for you. That consistency is built from basic fundamentals when you apply lean. The first fundamental is the morning meeting, which will drive your whole lean culture change and keep it going for years. It cannot be viewed as just an every day, half the people turning up, boring, paint-by-numbers session that many regular internal company meetings are. It must be different. I use the term domino effect to describe just how big an impact the morning meeting can have when done properly. The domino effect states that when you make a change to one behavior, it will activate a chain reaction and cause a shift in related behaviors too. In the words of Stanford professor B.J. Fogg, you can never change just one behavior. Our behaviors are interconnected, so when you change one behavior, other behaviors also shift. Your morning meeting is comparable to the domino effect because it is the one opportunity that the company leadership will have to set the tone. And that tone is excellence. Align people and motivate everyone to improve and engage with their work, their colleagues, and organization. Treat the morning meeting casually, and you treat your culture casually. I told the guys at Black Box to treat preparing their morning meeting in the same way they would prepare for a presentation to a key client. It's just as important to get that right. We want everyone to look forward to the morning meeting as an energizing experience, to build that culture, grow those people, learn to see waste, and celebrate success together. One of the questions that Greg, the Black Box Managing Director, posed to me was whether we should start off lean in an area, like production. It's a good question, and like most good answers, that begins with, it depends. When I once prepared the approach for the Thousand People Concrete Company, we were going to pick a business unit area with 100-odd people and build a center of excellence for lean. The idea was that we would do a fantastic job in one area and build that all-important curiosity so that the other units would want to do it too. Pull, not push. However, for an organization of Black Box's size, of less than 100 people, I was very much against that approach. Lean has a bad enough rap about being only a thing for manufacturing that this would have sent all the wrong messages. If you're going to do two-second lean and you have less than 100 people, then one single morning meeting is the way to go. Another common question is, do we need to do this every day? For me, the answer is an emphatic yes. It's about consistency. I don't know of a single vibrant, lean culture-based company that doesn't do it daily. It's about that word from the beginning of the chapter, consistency. Every day we have a routine, a kata. We don't have a day off from doing lean. Approaching lean like this also lets your organization build momentum. Essentially, you're building a habit, and you don't do that with a sporadic approach. No one maintains a successful lifestyle change 
by doing it some days and not others. Two-second lean as a model doesn't need testing. Hundreds, if not thousands, of companies all over the world are already doing it in a successful and similar way. As the famous Toyota engagement equation says, everyone, every day, engaged. It doesn't say some of the people, some days, sometimes engaged. There were almost 100 people at Black Box, so we already had a challenge about where to have the meeting to fit everyone in properly. Then to have adequate audiovisual facilities, ensuring everyone could engage with the content. In the end, we went with three big screens and a speaker system, and that did the job. For the first few meetings, though, they were not in place, and it was tough going as not everyone could see the content being presented. These are issues I would strongly recommend you sort before you start. For the first week, the people leading the morning meeting were from the company leadership team. Even though most of these people would have been used to giving presentations, they'd not had to deliver to almost 100 people in a room for 15 to 20 minutes very often. It's a whole other ball game. With a few exceptions, we got through that first week on a mixture of adrenaline and goodwill, but overall it went great. I used similar advice for the people holding the morning meeting as I did in my first Two Second Lean company. So there are four points here. The first one, project your voice so that people can hear you. If there is a microphone, learn how to hold it properly. The second, always thank everyone who contributes. Third, always clap first if you want to celebrate a contribution. That always gets everyone else started. And finally, be an expert in your content. The last one was an addition for Black Box. Many of the guys, and I include girls in that grouping, were spending too much time just reading their slides versus engaging with their audience, using the slides as a crutch. Frankly, that's really boring. It's perfectly fine for a newbie or a non-leadership person to be nervous and not a television standard presenter. I'd argue that it's even a really good thing because the rest of the team connects with that person who is getting outside their comfort zone. The lack of a polished performance is actually a positive in that case because it builds team spirit. However, it's different. If you're a senior figure in your organization, you are leading, you are setting a standard. If you're super nervous because you don't know the material and are avoiding eye contact by reading off the slides, it's not good. Your nervous negative energy will rub off on others. No matter what, if you're a newbie or a senior figure, rehearse and know your material because that is all part of the growth experience. Taking the time to read up on a new angle on your education slot deepens not only your own knowledge but also that of the entire team. As per the old Latin quote, the best way to learn is to teach. The guys at Black Box were pretty exceptional on this point from the get-go because it was not just a single figure leading the morning meeting for those first days and weeks. The senior guys took turns for the first couple of weeks, then it was rolled out to the 12 apostles, I mean the internal coaches here who were in the learning club, then to others, beyond that, on a voluntary basis. It was super positive stuff. Another common question people have is about the morning meeting agenda. I've seen a lot of different approaches to the morning meeting from my own experience of Lean and also on Lean tours of other organizations. Most of the approaches can stem back to how FastCap do theirs. And there are some great resources around how to do that on Paul Aker's website. Check out the resources section in the app or links in the description. From what I've seen, however, the morning meeting of a six-person company can be significantly different from that of a hundred people company. The reason for that is less than eight people can have a full-on interactive discussion, whereas when the numbers are greater than that, it is hard to facilitate without many of the people being spectators. And in most settings, the same people who by nature are quite extroverted 
will tend to dominate proceedings, making things boring for the rest of the group. So in larger organizations, the nature of communication tends to be outward, one to many, rather than being heavily discursive. This means that the morning meeting agenda and how it is run can be quite different depending on the organization. Here is a range of agenda items that can be used as a pick and mix for how you decide to run yours. I've split them into two basic categories, those that help you in building culture and those that concern education or growing people. Having agenda items on a rota, that means everyone takes a turn from day one, helps foster the idea of total participation and takes some of the burden off the morning meeting leader. It also serves to help prepare others for taking on that mantle. So here are the morning meeting agenda items, and I'm going to start with those that come under the heading Building Culture Items. So the first are the stretches or the physical icebreaker. Many find it strange that Western companies are all doing stretches. Personally, while it's certainly beneficial to get people's energy levels up by limbering a little, the main purpose behind them is to be an icebreaker for the group. It is an unusual activity. Not many companies are doing it, and I believe that it helps build your organization into its own little cult of us. When you're doing them, people make eye contact and smile, and connections are being made. When you alternate the leader, you also provide an opportunity for some of the more introverted team members to express their personalities and for people to bond with them. Whether they do a great job of leading the stretches or a bad one, it's all good. I can't imagine doing a morning meeting without the stretches. It just would not be the same. The second are gratefuls. The gratefuls point can seem strange too, but fostering that attitude of being grateful for what we have is one of the cornerstones of lean. Some people use the term givers. Lean is about us all giving. And giving seems easier when we do it from a place of abundance. The gratefuls help cultivate that. Putting them on a rota with people being advised that they will be speaking tomorrow is another way to build morning meeting leaders for the future. They get an opportunity to just speak a little bit, but often the point of gratitude has the person revealing a little of their lives outside work and expressing some vulnerability. It all builds team and gross culture. Next, a review of the key performance indicator. I always stress that the morning meeting can never be a production meeting, as in getting into the minutiae of what each of us has to do today. Use five to 10 minute stand-up meetings for those. That is not what the morning meeting is about. However, it is also not isolated from reality. So those how are we doing yesterday, this week, this month? Numbers are also positive to bring into the morning meeting, providing an opportunity for everyone to know what the priorities are and where there might be bottlenecks. The same effect can be achieved even if it's very difficult to get good numbers to talk around. One of my corporate lean buddies tells me that at his company, they simply go around the team leaders with a how was yesterday? question. They all know whether they had a good day or not. So this lets them talk about positives and not so positives from the day before and where they could do with some support. It's certainly not for beating anyone up or shaming a department. Any hard direct talking of that nature should be done outside the morning meeting. Next, shout outs. Shoutouts are another building culture point that should always be left open for people to randomly speak up. This is about expressing gratitude and celebrating the team member who went above and beyond to help gel your team together. You can gauge how vibrant your culture is by how eagerly people are willing to shout out their colleagues' support. Next, what are you proud of? What are you proud of is an agenda item done at Seating Matters to build engagement. According to Ryan Tierney, everyone has something they're proud of and they want to tell people about. 
This is especially good when it has absolutely nothing to do with the workplace, as it demonstrates people are giving of themselves to the team when they share. Last time I participated in the morning meeting at Seating Matters, the lady holding the meeting presented a photo of her with her grandchildren, telling everyone how much joy she got from being around them and how proud she was of them. It was so heartwarming. It is this opening up and revealing their real, non-work team member selves that is the real fuel in your engagement locker. It's far from just engaging with management. It's about engaging with the team at multiple levels. This builds trust, engagement, and commitment to the cause. Next, lean principles. This is an agenda point that I used with an agenda during my first two-second lean implementation. We had so many problems with culture around lack of mutual respect and blaming people when things went wrong. I developed the company Lean Principles as I encountered different cultural problems to get the ownership and the wider team to face them and adopt another approach. I used principles like no BMW, to inject humour into serious subjects. I'd ask who knew what BMW stood for. I'd get all kinds of car-related answers, ranging from the humorous to the serious. My reveal would be that it meant blaming, moaning, and whining. I don't want to hear any more of that around here. And we get a few laughs. Another one to advance change on this similar topic was Attack the blank, not the blank. Ask for guesses as to what the blanks represented and then do a reveal. It means attack the process, not the person. I'd repeat the new point for a few days before moving on to another one. And when I had developed 21 in total, I put that on a daily repeat rota that we would cycle over day after day to deepen it further into our culture. Repetition. The next is quote of the day. I used to use this item with a similar agenda. I was not just looking for some pretty sounding words. I generally wanted to convey a serious message behind the quote I used. Lean quotes from the founding fathers of Lean are also brilliant as education tools. Finding a quote can also be a task that the person chairing the morning meeting can have as part of their preparation as your culture becomes more mature. Depending on the number of people in your meeting, you can choose whether this part of your meeting is an opportunity to discuss the concept behind the quote in more depth or not. Next culture building point is celebrate success. This is an essential piece of culture building that the best lean organizations do at the end of their morning meeting. At the very least, show the best of yesterday's improvements from the team. The best practice is to put every single before and after and at least a clip of each improvement video into a less than a four minute video at the end of the morning meeting to finish it on a motivational high. People love to see their bit and it's best if the voiceover narrative shouts people out by name. When I first started putting YouTube improvement videos and compilations of them into the WhatsApp group of the original company where I did Two Second Lean, I found out through the back door that people were sharing them with friends and family. It was a bit like, as we say in Ireland, being on the telly. I love this kind of recognition and the feeling of appreciation that it generates. Often these guys have never had the words thank you said to them with regards to work. And now someone is making crazy cool videos and bigging them up in front of the company. And in some cases, with lean videos that are seen by thousands of people all over the world in the lean community. What's not to like about this? Showing that video at the end of the meeting sets the tone for the team to go out and do it all, all over again. Next point on the culture building are the recognition awards. Nobody would normally associate Lean with the Oscars, but I've seen the connection in action. I came up with the idea while working with the guys at Black Box. They were making their celebration videos every day, but I thought there could be more. I came up with the idea 
of an award ceremony to put recognition on steroids. We told the team that there would be awards for best improvement, best video, best before and after, best team, and outstanding contribution. I'm not sure they really knew what I meant by the B-Bras. These were the Black Box Recognition Awards. On that Friday morning, I came in dressed in a tuxedo with black tie. At the entrance to the morning meeting, we played typical award ceremony music, and I teed up people to present the awards, complete with envelopes containing the nomination and winners. It was great fun. I know I was probably considered a little crazy by a lot of people, but that's half the point. If things are becoming stale, try something different and run the experiment. It might fail, but it could also be knocked out of the park. The worst thing to do is continue Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. In the same vein, some companies, seating matters spring to mind, invite external speakers in to spice the meeting up and present a new angle on an education topic, health and fitness for example, where they got a top trainer to come in and show some new stretches and deliver talks on nutrition and exercise. Ultimately, the cardinal sin is to let the morning meeting get stale. Do whatever you must to stop that happening at all costs. The next section is about the education items. And the education segment is where the content is. This is the main part towards achieving our growing people agenda, or learning to see waste. There is a plethora of information available, especially on YouTube, that provides great material for training your people. Sometimes it can seem to take an eternity to dig it out, especially at the start of your journey, but it gets easier. So the first part on the education items is around the three S or eight wastes every day. And this is on a schedule circulating through the different wastes or the S's. At the beginning, it makes sense to spend a few morning meetings consecutively on each waste or S of the three S's so people don't get the feeling that they are skimming over the subject in too superficial a way. Then, after that initial foundation has been laid, Get going with putting that on a daily schedule, rotating through the eight wastes and three S's on a daily basis. That repetition never stops, but as you progress, other education points can be added. Different lean tools, for example, Kanban or Kamichi buy boards, product training, competitor benchmarking on a particular aspect or an industry trend or development. As long as it serves your people to help deepen their knowledge and stimulate improvements, it's all good. It's really important that your repetition does not get stale, however. Boring is not what we're after. I coined a term called creative repetition to put this point across. Yes, we want to deepen our understanding of the eight wastes and the three S's, but we need to make sure that we look at each individual waste from a variety of different angles, rather than the same thing over and over. At the same time, it's perfectly fine to repeat a brilliant piece of material a few times to make sure that the learning gets in there. It really just requires good judgment to find a balance. It's great to get your education from the people within your team. There will always be some people who get lean at a higher level, much faster than others, so it's great to use those leaders as examples to educate and inspire others within the team. The next education item is the 3S Hero, and you can put this on a rota through your entire team. I used to do the 3S Hero slot in my first organization on a rota where each team member had to do a video of their workplace, how they had 3S'd it, and recite the 3S's the way that we were teaching them. Some of the guys' English was really poor, so we allowed them to do it in their own language with the help of a colleague to translate. This is another example where an obstacle can be turned into an opportunity. Getting people to help each other out and get out of their comfort zone while showing off their learning to others and having the opportunity to collectively learn is again 
just the juice that gets lean flowing. The next education point is the favourite improvement from other companies. This is one that Seating Matters do every day. Like myself, the guys at Seating Matters are members of various WhatsApp and Signal groups where dozens of improvements from different companies are shared. The ones that resonate with them are shared with their team to stimulate their minds about how those innovations might be applied within their work environment. Next is the quality or safety moment. We used to have an agenda item, defects, in my first company, but this term comes with a lot of finger pointing. I've seen it much better done with quality moment. This agenda item can be used to highlight a recent defect that occurred internally or reached a customer, informing the team and communicating on what countermeasures have taken place to prevent reoccurrence. A similar approach can be used for safety moments to highlight near misses, accidents, or any new policies or processes around safety improvement. So there you are. These are the pick and mix of your agenda items for your morning meeting. But you can, and you kind of must, do your own thing with your morning meeting and your improvement time. These will just help get your creative juices flowing. But it's likely you will develop your own style and agenda items that will work best for your organization. The key is consistency. Never miss the morning meeting and keep these meetings filled with positive energy. It's about constantly deepening the understanding of your people around the culture and wastes so that the improvements and the consequential results come. Sitting alongside the morning meeting is the second fundamental of 3S improvement time which is when the team gets the opportunity to put their learning into practice by applying it to making improvements, reducing the struggle and waste in everything we do. As we've touched on earlier, most companies take half an hour for this. This is enough time for most organizations to allow a good cleanup and improvements to be made. From a leadership perspective, the most important point I can make here is being visibly interested and triple X for your team with consistency. If you scurry back to your desk after the morning meeting, you are sending out all the wrong signals. If you are only visibly present the odd time, it sends out the same non-consistent, no commitment message. The entire organization needs to be on the gamba, especially the leadership team. No excuses all the time. The morning meeting and improvement time combined are your kata. This is a Japanese martial arts term that best matches our English word routine. A good lean process is based on a clear kata and the most important one, if you want to be truly great, is the one you do daily with consistency. So next we're going to look at the level up of continuously improving how you do lean with the PDCA, PDR, or Hansei cycle. A key part of your lean system needs to be creating a feedback loop on your overall process and how it's going. PDCA stands for Plan, Do, Check, Action and is often called the Deming cycle after its creator, W.E. Deming. PDR or plan do review is a similar variant of the same process. If Taichi Ono is the father of Lean, Deming could be called the grandfather because he was a leader of the original group of American engineers who brought these principles to Japan after World War II. Fundamentally, it's about being deliberate that the quality of your process inputs are constantly reviewed to ensure the process is kept stable and produces high quality results. The second part I recommend is more of an attitude rather than a system, Hansei. This Japanese word has various meanings depending on the definition you use, but the overall meaning I choose to coach is to look back with regret. I first learned about the principle in Japan on my Lean Study mission. 
We had an amazing visit to a Japanese primary school at lunchtime. There were about 500 kids having lunch in this canteen, happy as anything, smiling and talking with each other. In spite of that, our group could still converse with each other without raising our voices. The kids went up and collected their trays of healthy food, already telling the server if there was anything they did not think they would eat, to minimize any wasted food. When they were finished with their meals, they put all the materials in the right recyclable waste containers and there was hardly any waste. Quite a lot different to things in the West. When they were leaving the dining room, each child went up individually to say thank you to the kitchen staff who had prepared their meal. And next, you won't believe what they were going to do. The next part of lunchtime was about the entire school cleaning it. The schools don't have janitors over there. The kids do everything themselves. Vacuuming and polishing floors and windows, weeding the lawns and flower beds, even taking the old leaves out from underneath bushes. The energy was incredible, and it was really clear from their attitudes that they were happy to do this. They were happy and smiling, having fun. It wasn't like watching forced labor. However, I still have not got to the most impressive part. At the end of cleaning time, each class got together for their hand say. There is no official leader. The kids say things like, I wasn't really on form today. I was just messing around. Sorry for that. I'll do better tomorrow. Not everyone, just a few, and it wasn't a shaming exercise. The other kids would be giving back an attitude of, That's okay. Thanks for telling us. We will do better tomorrow. It was amazing for me to witness. I was so impressed. The level of maturity these kids exhibited was just jaw-dropping. And they were only nine years old. When I was coaching with Black Box, I explained to the guys that regularly, looking back with regret, was a great practice and spirit to cultivate. I encouraged them to ask, how did I do after the morning meeting they had led? with a spirit that went beyond great buddy, but actively to want constructive criticism as to how we could do it better next time, either as an individual or as a team. Each week on Friday afternoon, we did a hand say to reflect on the things gone well and the things gone not so well from the previous week, looking at various ways that we could improve that all-important engagement. I discovered years ago that there is a whole different flavor to using those terms rather than the traditional things gone wrong, things gone right approach. It encourages more honesty and less blame within the team and gets the creative juices flowing. We are all learning together. We came up with a proxy metric for our engagement to ascertain how we were doing. This was to count how many media posts we were getting in our WhatsApp group and use them as an indicator for how many improvements we were making and what the level of engagement was. We also compiled a league table of the people and departments who were making the most improvements and had the highest level of engagement. These numbers were also communicated to everyone in the morning meeting. The idea is to pull others along and provide extra recognition for those going above and beyond. Black Box, being a sport fitness company, with a strong culture associated with that, had a group of people who loved competing. So in a positive way, being top of the league became something that departments and individuals strove for. It put a smile on people's faces. It was fun. And while this might not work in every company, the key is to find what is fun to your people. And Bill's team and drives engagement consistently. Developing these daily, weekly, and monthly milestone checks within your kata and applying them with consistency is so important to make sure that your efforts don't start drifting off the rails, which they certainly will. No one said this was easy. Those trials are part of your team's development opportunities when doing two-second lean. If and when... <laughs> People stop seeing more waste or don't know where the next improvement is coming from. That is a sign, an opportunity to grow, 
It requires commitment and means that you need to dig deeper to bring more training and education to your team so they can see the waste or spot that next improvement. That is where your team will find the biggest and best parts of Two Second Lean, providing they don't take the easy route and blame the system. It's not the system. It's their depth of understanding that is lacking. So now we're going to talk about the four P's. Priority, practice, patience, and persistence. I was really fortunate at this stage of my black box coaching in that I came across a social media post from a guitar tutor friend of mine talking about how to learn to play that I don't think I made clear enough. A friend of mine is the guy in the studio with me helping me record this audio book. Hello, Adrian Curran. Thank you. <laughs> So Adrian spoke about practice, persistence, and patience. I thought it had great crossover potential to doing lean. You need to do it regularly, and by that we mean every day. Practice. You need to keep at it, even when you don't feel like it. Persistence. And lastly, the results are unlikely to come in a day or two. It takes time before you see evidence of success. And that takes patience. In spite of lean being the art of subtraction, I added another P to it, priority. Because none of that happens if you don't make lean a priority. It's actually more important than any of these, as without it, none of the rest has a chance. To illustrate this, I will use the example of my own guitar playing. When I was a kid, I had a guitar, and I learned about a dozen chords, But because I was a good singer and used to play in bands that way, I never felt motivated to learn to play the guitar at a good level. For my 40th birthday, I spent about $1,000 on a nice Takamine guitar because I thought now was the time to put more effort into learning how to play. I did it for a few weeks and then stopped. I still couldn't play any tune properly, despite that I knew the chords. I knew what to do, as in how to play the guitar intellectually, but I'd never made it a priority to put in the time to practice necessary to become a good guitar player, or had the patience and persistence to get those results. The priority was the problem. The rest I can do for other things, like meditation, for example. I haven't missed a morning meditation in over three years. My meditation practice is the foundation that the rest of my life is built on, and I derive tremendous benefits from it. At the time of writing, I'm now learning to become a high-level meditation teacher, and I'm very comfortable to be able to come from a place of strong experience to do so. The only difference between meditation and the guitar? Priority. I was recently talking with another senior corporate lean body about this stuff, who is now helping other divisions and units within his massive organization to apply two-second lean. However, the mentality of a typical corporate mindset can be a huge barrier. Everyone is so focused on their KPIs, and only the KPIs, delivering their short-term results up the chain, and I can categorically say that if that is your focus and emphasis when trying to apply lean, then your efforts will be short-lived. In real cultural transformation, results are often the last thing that becomes evident. The focus always has to be around engagement. That's about wholehearted buy-in from everyone, total participation. This is especially important at the beginning of your lean journey. If it's about getting results, your people will smell your lack of authenticity about this just being another tool. You will not get engagement, and you will fail on your journey before you even really started. So it's all about engagement. 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 When you get engagement, which can be measured in smiles and body language, the next thing you will see are improvements as people jump on the train in their own time. Each person's individual level of understanding 
develops at their own personal pace as they get it. Pull with only a little push. Grow the people, build the culture, and the rest will follow. Push is reserved only for people actively stopping the process from moving forward, destructively resisting it. Two words apply to them, with zero tolerance. Get out! As the improvements gather steam, you will start to see the results improving. It can take a few months. Generally, physical transformation of the workplace happens in weeks, and real tangible improvements start to trickle out over the first weeks, but really months to get momentum. Then the results start to take off and keep going off the chart as your kata develops consistency and momentum. That only takes place with priority, practice, persistence, and patience. Or alternatively put, candor, commitment, coaching, and consistency. It's all a matter of leadership, human behavior, and not a little bit of love. A little used word in business circles. All challenges are opportunities to grow. True lean is not felt in the head, it is felt in the heart. It is a heart based exchange between souls. If your lean journey is ever going in a direction you don't like, look in the mirror as a leader to discover where you are going wrong. Then open your heart to your people in a spirit of understanding to know what needs changing. Often, it will be you that needs to change. Sometimes, they will realize that they need to change, and other times, as a leader, you will need to change the people or change the people. No matter what happens, every obstacle is an opportunity for growth. Every interaction Every challenge starts with I. The real learning is not done during the easy times. It happens when things are tough. The learning doesn't occur when someone else solves a problem for you. It only truly happens when you search for your own solutions by digging deeper and finding ways to make things work. There is an Indian parable that I really love about the caterpillar struggling to get out of the cocoon. It can struggle for an entire day to push itself out, and when it succeeds, it becomes a beautiful butterfly. A kind human could look at the poor caterpillar struggling and help it by cutting away the cocoon to set it free. However, that kind of kindness can kill. The butterfly needs to struggle out of the cocoon squeezing the moisture out of its wings so that it can fly. Without the struggle, that doesn't happen, and it withers and dies. Success comes from the struggle. While shortcuts exist, they may not do good in the long run. You need to find your own way through. It calls to mind one of my favorite lean quotes from Mr. Amazawa, whom I had the pleasure to meet during my study mission with Paul Akers. Be happy when you have problems. They are opportunities to grow. You will always have challenges in life. It's designed that way. You can waste your energy trying to resist what is, pulling yourself into stress, anxiety, and drama, or you can consciously relax, open your heart, and ask, what am I supposed to be learning from this? embracing your challenges in whatever form they take and see how that goes. You always have a choice as to which approach you take, but I can promise you that embracing this attitude will lead you down a much better road than the widespread current practice of blaming the world for your problems. It all works much better when you realize that improvement starts with I. So here are the takeaways for the consistency chapter. Number one, build your own kata that happens every day, morning meetings and 3S improvement time. Number two, morning meetings are about engagement first, building culture and growing people through education. Number three, make sure you have a feedback loop 
to ensure that your kata never becomes stale. Positive energy is key. Chapter 5. The Fifth C. Continuous Learning. And there's more. That quote's from Jimmy Cricket. He's a very cheesy Northern Ireland comedian. When I asked for contributions to this book from my lean friends, I expected my friend Ryan Tierney of Seating Matters to pick commitment. I expected him to describe some huge barrier he'd had to overcome to become one of the best SME lean companies on the planet. He surprised me when he picked this chapter of continuous learning as his contribution. I'm very grateful to Ryan for taking the time out to record his contribution in his own words. It all changed when I went to Japan to the Lean Study Mission with Paul Akers. I made sure to sit in the right seat right beside Paul so I could pick up every little nugget of information and get as much information from the experience as possible. I will never forget it. JB, another Seat Matters Lean leader, was sitting right beside me and I had a total light bulb moment. We had just visited Mifune and Mr. Amazawa was at the front of the bus and he said something along the lines of, Toyota don't just make cars, we teach and train people. I wrote it down in my book and that night I was discussing it with JB and said that this might be one of my biggest takeaways from the trip. And the trip had only just started. These days we've had more than 500 people at Seating Matters for a lean tour and they say at the beginning of every lean tour we are a teaching and training organisation that happens to make chairs. We could make anything. We could make cars, we could make robots, it doesn't matter. We're a teaching and training organization that is continuously learning. The morning meeting is the most important part of our day because we are continuously learning. Every single day in the morning meeting, we pick a different learning topic and every single person has to take their turn holding that, that meeting and revising the material the night before to deepen their understanding of that topic to a level where they can teach it to others. That all started with that light bulb moment in Japan. Toyota is a teaching and training organization. I thought, this is unbelievable. This is exactly what we are. So I'd like to say thanks to Ryan for that story and for all his help and support during this journey so far. This point is totally key to doing Lean the right way. It's not about the visuals and certainly not the graphs and wallpaper of traditional Western corporate lean. They have their place, but they are not central to building a sustainable culture, as we've seen. To continuously keep improving, lean organizations have to be continuously learning, at the level of the individual, at the level of I, to sustain and deepen their culture. The morning meeting is at the heart of that process, and everyone in the organization needs to recognize that this is the purpose, to teach and train people. Originally, consistency was the end of this book. But like all lean maniacs, I never stop learning. I grasped some new things while I was writing it that I just couldn't help sharing. So that's why I added this additional chapter. And it really helps illustrate this point. Learning starts with I. Lean people never, ever stop, and they have a hunger for learning. I hope you find these final two sections useful. There are two points. Your eight wastes may not be the same as Toyota's, and the importance of standards. Both are about strengthening your lean system, but in quite different ways. We thought we were committing lean heresy when we started to question the traditional wastes. But really, it's very strongly in the tradition of the Toyota production system to innovate your thinking and apply the system in the best way for the circumstances. Standards are literally the foundation of lean. Without them, your results will always be up to chance. So both concepts will add value for most of you. Now, let's go with the first. Beyond the eight wastes, your eight wastes may not be the same as Toyota's. If you watched the Lumen AME tour video from chapter two, you will already have an idea about what we are going to discuss here. 
In my experience, without a doubt, for almost all lean companies, it's easier to achieve and maintain momentum in the manufacturing area than it has been in those that are more office-based with computer-based virtual processes. It's even more difficult for those organizations with significant numbers of people working remotely. After the initial rush of adrenaline at getting started with Lean, 3Sing the office space, tidying up their PC desktops, and creating file directory structures, it's very easy for the people in those parts of the organization to become disengaged because they simply don't know what to do next. I've tried to help companies get over this problem by teaching that anything the customer doesn't want to pay for or anything the company would rather do less of as a way for those people to identify waste within their processes, which is similar to the Brad Cairns approach mentioned in the coaching chapter. But honestly, it has a limited effect and engaging these teams has still been a struggle. Part of the problem is, is that the traditional eight waste don't speak well to these functions, especially those who have a very limited physical dimension to their work. That's because Taiichi Ono's seven wastes that later became eight were written for 1950s Toyota, a cash-strapped business in danger of bankruptcy. They couldn't afford to have cash tied up in piles of inventory or half-utilized expensive capital equipment. So the waste he came up with were business killers for them. But now those same wastes are being shoehorned into third millennium companies, many of whom have completely different challenges or wastes with little or no physical product. They could hardly be more different to post-World War II Toyota. My business partner at Lumen Electronics, Patrick McGee, was the man to spot this and have his Satori, or awakening moment, while watching Paul Akers interview lean legend Norman Bodek, may he rest in peace, during a trip in Japan. Norman described this exact issue as the reason why over 98% of American companies fail at doing lean. We certainly had this problem at Lumen Electronics, we were able to apply the traditional eight waste very well to our physical and especially manufacturing processes. But most of the value we create is at a computer, designing electronic circuits or writing embedded software code. Simply put, many of the eight wastes were totally irrelevant. For example, we didn't overproduce engineering work. We didn't even own a forklift. And trying to say that inventory was analogous to computer files costing a few dollars a month on a server is literally beyond a joke. It makes a mockery of the real wastes. Meanwhile, we certainly had real business challenges that our Kaizen activities were having a limited impact upon. So over the space of several months, Patrick took the lead in writing our eight wastes for the electronic design process that addressed our pain points that were causing sleepless nights for us, as well as wasting our scarce resources and causing our customers pain. Patrick used me as a sounding board, and while we had some seriously robust discussions, what we were doing for many lean companies was heresy. But after those few initial skirmishes, Patrick managed to convince me that this was the right track. Eventually, we came up with our eight wastes, which are as follows. Project Ambiguity This is when it's not clear what the scope of a project is, or its deliverables, and leads to customer dissatisfaction, because what we deliver is not what they expected. Or from our side, where we spend days working for free to give a feature or level of performance that was not planned at the outset. This is our mother of all wastes for this process, as when we experience this, many other wastes are multiplied, just like traditional overproduction. The next was called variations, where non-standard components or processes are used, which adds complexity to delivering a technical outcome or causes issues in the supply chain when launching into production. The third was bad code 
Code that is buggy, that means it doesn't work well, or just as bad is difficult to comprehend by anyone but the author. This causes masses of non-value added time by another engineer trying to work out the tech stack, managing that handover before they can start adding value, i.e. physically changing the code. Next was bad hardware, where a component doesn't behave as we had expected due to insufficient due diligence on a data sheet, or not behaving as the data sheet would lead us to believe. Next, we have searching, and this is for development components or code, really a subset of traditional overprocessing, but we get real value out of calling our critical waste exactly what it is. Now we have manufacturing integration, which means poor design for manufacture. In our case, difficult to screw together, or worse, program and test. Done badly, this costs us business. Then we have commercial engagement, which is around project proposals with inappropriate payment schedules that eat cash or terms, inappropriate pricing, which is too high or too low, or not managing time spent on a project well, leading to overruns. Next, we have interruptions. This we call the shoulder tap. When an engineer is in deep work, headphones on, writing complex code, and someone interrupts with a, where is the screwdriver, type question. We made this the key subject for our AME Lean Tour, and it has already resonated with hundreds of companies around the world. We are already being told about companies who are naming their eight wastes of design, or eight wastes of sales, and getting real value from it. We get asked all the time, how did you come up with your eight wastes? As other companies want to follow the same path. So here is our recommendation. Number one, the leadership team need to brainstorm the main strategic problems that are hurting the business in terms of costs, sheer frustration, or wasted opportunities. Initially, that should be done in a small team with the main functional heads participating. The team's main role is to highlight the pain points within their functions as well as those of the overall business. One person, preferably the most senior, should take the lead in facilitating the activity. Here are some potential catalysts to get the creative juices flowing for understanding what your critical wastes could be. Perhaps these are lurking in your business. The first one is bottlenecks or leaks. What is stopping your business from growing faster due to a constraint or what causes you to lose customers? All businesses have those, so name them and get them on the table for discussion with your wider team. Next, lost margin. This could be due to inappropriate pricing to the customer, either too high, losing volume, or too low, giving the product away, which is an opportunity for the sales and finance teams to work collectively to analyze the pricing strategy for effectiveness. Next, stockouts. We talk of excess inventory in the traditional eight wastes, but the opposite is not being able to serve a customer because we have no stock. Product availability versus inventory turns can be good measures that need to be optimized together. This also provides an opportunity for sales and purchasing teams to cooperate more closely on forecasting and buying patterns or stocking policies. Next, cost of customer acquisition. Simply put, how much is it costing you to win that new customer or that new sale? Do you know? Does it make sense? Do you understand your sales funnel? Do you measure how it leaks and why? Next, non-build work time. Perhaps a form of overprocessing, but being explicit, especially in service-based businesses, how much of your people's time is billed against what you would like to bill? Next one is meeting time. 
How much of the time spent in meetings are value added for each individual sitting in that meeting? Another one is non value added communication. That means extra emails, meetings, or phone calls, either internal or external, that did not need to happen for value to be created for the customer. That list is not meant in any way to be exhaustive. It's just there to give you some examples to get the discussion going. They also don't need to add up to eight, by the way. It could be three, four, or five different wastes. But I wouldn't recommend having many more than eight because it will be hard to focus actions appropriately. Step two is to prioritize those that are most critical and describe them in detail in written form. When Patrick did this at Lumen, his initial paper ended up being 15 pages long. Now you don't have to do that, but it is important to work on delivering clarity to the rest of the team about these potential wastes. Step three is to circulate that paper to the team and meet to agree on what the list of final wastes will look like. Step four is to start to make those new wastes part of the morning meeting education process. So there you have it. We got a huge benefit out of naming the waste. Rather than leaving the vague description of what waste was, as the traditional what the customer doesn't want to pay for, being specific was like putting on a pair of waste vision goggles for our people. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. And we are now much more effective at working at and reducing those wastes. We reckon our wastes will also evolve with time. We have already made huge strides at eliminating the waste of project ambiguity by having paid discovery phases with customers to identify the key technical issues and precisely define project deliverables at the outset, as well as taking a lot more care to put precision into our project proposals. As the effects of these improvements become evident, we will find other wastes that might become more important and need to be named. I recommend every company doing lean takes this approach during their lean journey. Remember, everything in life is a process, or the outcome of a process, and is therefore imperfect and has waste in there. Be smart and name that waste together with your people. This is the second post-book learning I wanted to give you, and we're going to call that the value of standard operating procedures. Patrick and I had been working together for about a year, developing the Lumen business into new areas, and taking our lean culture a little higher every day. When one day, Patrick asked me to raise the standard about how we documented the standard work or operating procedures for the program, assembly and test processes on a new product we were launching to the market, a fall detection and transmitter product for aged care settings. Historically, if processes like these had been documented at all at Lumen, it would have been a wall of text that anyone except the technician who wrote it could not have possibly understood. Several times before, we had tried to set up a process to run some parts without person X present. When we dug out the SOP hidden in some folder away from the Gemba, it was unintelligible, useless as a tool. Therefore, we knew that we needed to do better if we ever wanted to scale the business at Lumen without relying on the tribal knowledge stuck in a few people's heads. Back to Patrick and me. No problem, I replied, because I'd written dozens of SOPs before, particularly at my first two second lean company. I said, no problem, even though I knew it was a pain in the... <clears throat> Taking photos of the process with my phone, taking notes, messing about with Excel, iteration after iteration, and so on. It often took an entire afternoon to document all but the simplest processes this way, but I thought I would take one for the team. 
I already had a couple of different standard operating procedure templates that I had previously developed to use as a base. After I spent the afternoon documenting just a small part of the process, I showed the shiny new SOP to Patty, expecting a well done mate. The response was not what I expected. I got a meh. Well, I think that's what my teenage daughter says when she's not happy about something. And uh, how long did that take? When I told him it was the entire afternoon, Patrick asked, but don't you have a software company? It was the ultimate fix what bugs you. I took on the challenge and by the early evening, I had sketched out the screen designs for what is now Gambadocs. Initially, we thought of the development as being for Lumen only, but when we showed it to our lean friends, the response was so positive that we built a commercial version with great success. After just one month, we already had dozens of companies around the world using the software. It was great. We learned so much as part of this entire process that I thought it would be good to share here, because most people in lean circles do not understand how fundamental standards or standard operating procedures are to their lean efforts. Standard operating procedures are a much misunderstood and badly implemented concept in many organizations. Business leaders often like the idea of having processes documented so that they can become less reliant on tribal knowledge, which is so easily lost making business continuity difficult to maintain. Global staff shortages and short-term people availability shocks due to issues such as COVID restrictions exacerbate the problem. However, these benefits are only a fraction of what well-implemented SOPs can deliver. And the fact that these benefits are underestimated is a significant reason why most businesses are not sufficiently motivated to put living, breathing, useful SOPs in place. They don't understand the benefits properly, so they don't allocate the time and resources necessary to make it happen. In addition, until now, current methods to create and maintain SOPs have been super cumbersome, meaning that most businesses don't see the effort versus reward equation stacking up. So to understand how the situation can be improved, let's look at some questions. So what actually is an SOP? Well, here's a definition. Standard operating procedures are detailed descriptions of the prescribed method that team members must follow to carry out a given process in a particular organization. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? It sounds like we're placing a set of handcuffs on our team members rather than providing a useful tool to help them be more successful in their work. And therein lies half the problem as to why there are so few successful SOP implementations. For SOPs to become truly useful in an organization, the team members need to feel that they own them not that they have been imposed on them. No one likes being a slave. They need to be understood as tools that make work life easier and better, not milestones around their necks. The key to doing this well is in our next question. How do we write an SOP? Well, we were very fortunate that we had a lot of interaction with a gentleman called Mark Warren around the subject of SOPs. Mark actually wrote the manual for how Toyota delivered standard work training in North America, called Training Within Industry. Mark helped us create some posters for making job breakdowns, and they're in the physical book, but I'm gonna describe them here verbally. So we had one poster for making job breakdowns, and it had four rules. Rule number one, write the job breakdown where the work is done, not at your desk. Rule number two, write the job breakdown as a team, not by yourself. Rule number three, 
Make sure the team includes subject matter experts, the most skilled operators. Rule number four, test the job breakdown with your team. Practice to make sure it is not missing critical details and define appropriate coaching units. I know this is important from experience. During my first ever real job back in automotive, one of my tasks was to write standard operating procedures and quality procedures for the ISO 9000 manual. It was tremendous because I learned early on the procedures that looked great on my PC in the office, written by me, were completely useless. During those early stages, I would proudly take out my shiny new procedure I'd written with barely any consultation with the guys doing the job and basically get told to move on. You can see rule number one. I'm being very diplomatic in describing what the guys actually said. I learned that the whole process worked much better when I worked with the guys on the workplace, on the Gamba, to document what they were already doing and then work with them to agree any changes necessary to meet the quality standard. See rules number two, three, and four. They had a much higher degree of ownership when I did things that way. When this is done as a team, each member gets to describe how they carry out the task. Often, everyone does it a little bit differently. And when this is surfaced, everyone gets to contribute and evaluate each other's method. This leads to what I call the best of method, where the team agrees on a compilation of each member's best ways of doing a task, which is better than anyone's individual approach before. Not only does this create ownership within the team, but this process of creating a new baseline raises the standard of how that process is carried out for everyone. This is a huge source of process improvement, which is one of the most often missed benefits of implementing SOPs. It is also a great way of building team cohesion. In my early automotive days, I also learned another crucial lesson that few people are truly aware of. This is in bold writing in the book. If you are going to create an SOP, if it adds burden to the people doing the job and that burden is not 100% necessary and understood, the standard will definitely not be followed. You will turn yourself into a police person trying to enforce the law all the time. It's key that the standard makes getting a high quality outcome easier, not more difficult. Easy, simple, high-quality processes are followed. Difficult, complex processes are always a struggle. Remember this. So a question we often get asked is how to keep SOPs current, or even more important, make sure they are followed. SOPs can't be viewed as monuments. By that I mean that once they are put in place, they are never supposed to move. A well-implemented SOP culture views SOPs as the baseline, the standard we all must follow. However, there must also be a process that facilitates change and improvement. This is most often the place where well-intentioned SOP efforts fall down. Outdated methods such as creating and editing in Excel mean that adding or moving a process step turns into hours of effort, as well as managing a proper document control system to cope with revisions. These tasks often fall on one overburdened individual who becomes the bottleneck, and eventually people just start to bypass the system. When that happens, or if there are other reasons why the process to make changes is too cumbersome, it won't be long before the SOPs just turn into wallpaper. And by that I mean, I mean that they look good, but because they are now out of date, no one is following them. 
and they probably provide more harm than benefit as they are a false source of security. This particular pain point is one of the primary reasons we developed the GembaDoc software. Edits can be made in seconds, approved in minutes by the appropriate people, and put live instantaneously. All done on the Gemba by the appropriate team of people to make and approve the process change. No running backwards and forwards to a computer for hours. It takes minutes. We don't know of a better way. It makes SOPs living, breathing, and useful. Now we are going to look at step-by-step -step SOPs versus video SOPs, because this is a debate among many lean people. Some organizations try to deal with SOPs by using video as a method of documenting a procedure. In the first instance, this seems like the perfect answer. It can only take a few minutes to shoot a video on someone's phone, right? But then you probably need to edit it, which takes some time. Then it needs to be hosted somewhere to be accessible to people on the Gemba, either on a server, the cloud, or a video platform like YouTube or Vimeo. Still, it's not too bad. It's easy to document our process. Until you want to use it as a training tool for a new starter. For a physical process, we can watch the process together. Then we can pause it intermittently to describe it to the newbie. Now we want to gradually move away from the newbie as they become more autonomous. Are they expected to stop, start the video to refer to it as they remind themselves of process steps? Not much fun for the newbie. Now, what happens if we want to make a process improvement and the video needs to be revised to bring it up to date. Well, where is the video stored? In many organizations that I've seen, that's a good question. The original has probably been wiped from the originator's phone as they take up so much space. We can't edit the hosted versions on YouTube, so it's back to square one. From what I've seen, video SOPs are mostly shot once and once only, soon to become wallpaper as the actual process method evolves, but the cumbersome nature of making a revision means they soon get left behind. So video SOPs make organizations feel good. But to question how useful they are, ask how many times they have been updated. If that number is low, then the SOP is probably out of date, or not much is happening in the way of process improvement. In our organizations, some processes are on revision 10, and they have only been operating for six months. We make improvements and update our SOPs instantaneously on our GembaDoc software. That's why we recommend step-by-step -step SOPs over video any day. In general, step-by-step -step SOPs are a better training tool, and the lack of friction involved to keep them up to date when making process improvements makes them a winning solution. P.S. On rare occasions, we integrate short videos into our step-by-step -step SOPs for nuanced processes that are tricky to describe in a step-by-step -step way. We call that a hybrid approach. GembaDocs has a facility to upload a link and display the video as a QR code on the SOP printed document. It's a rare use case, but it happens. So what kind of processes require an SOP? We have a saying in Lean Circles coming from Paul Akers that everything is a process. You've probably heard me say that a dozen times already, but hey, repetition helps it sink in. I would always add to the everything is a process by saying everything is a process, and if it's a process, it can be documented, and it can also be improved. So any process can be documented. Here are the two categories. The first would be a core value-adding process for an organization. The normal example that people consider here are often around manufacturing processes. It's true that these kind of SOPs, especially step-by-step, -step, originate from that sector. However, that's not the end of the story. Any business-critical process particularly those key to adding value for a customer, should be documented. 
An organization does not have to have a physical product for this to be the case. Think of a dentist surgery or a hospital setting, for example. There is a process from receiving, registering a patient through to myriad different forms of assessment and treatment in the process of this organization. So these kinds of processes can be both physical, a manufacturing or distribution process, or virtual, computer-based. Both will benefit from having an SOP developed to improve quality, cost, and consistency of customer experience. The second type of process that you can document for an SOP is a simple-to-do process. For example, turning on a machine, changing a printer cartridge, and so on. So for this second type, the simple-to-do, it's important to put the answer where the question is. How many times have we encountered these kinds of interruptions to the flow of our day? How do I change the paper in the printer? How do I access the Wi-Fi? How do I book in this client? And so on and so on. Documenting these information deficits on processes that can be a significant productivity killer when the knowledge is not there, and then making that answer available at point of use is a no-brainer improvement. Next, we have a question that is one of the holy grails of SOPs that we touched on earlier, but we're going to get into more detail here. How do we make sure SOPs are followed? When we have followed the process for writing the SOP already described, that is a huge step towards ensuring that the people actually doing the job feel ownership for the SOP and are therefore likely to follow it. But on its own, this is unlikely to be enough. It is key that everyone who carries out task X is trained in how to do it, as per the SOP. This is especially important for business-critical value-adding processes. This was another key part of the learning we received from Mark Warren. We developed this graphic based on his material. I'm going to describe it here verbally for you. And this one is the job instruction pocket card on how to instruct. And it has four steps. Step one, prepare the worker. And this is about putting the person at ease, stating the job, find out what the person already knows, get the person interested in learning the job, and finally, put the person in the correct position. Step two, is about presenting the operation. And here we tell, show, and illustrate one important step at a time. We stress each key point and its reason, instructing clearly, completely, and patiently, giving no more than they can master at one time. Step three, try out performance. Have the person do the job and correct for errors. Have the person do the job and get them to explain key points and reasons. Making sure the person understands. Continue until you know they know. Step four is follow up. Put the person on their own. Tell them who to go for for help. Check back in frequently, encourage them to ask questions, and start to taper off the coaching. At the bottom of the poster graphic, we have one bold sentence that's really important. If the person hasn't learned, the instructor hasn't taught. In my experience, very few organizations out of automotive truly understand this. It's generally the exact opposite. So preparing the worker, step one, and presenting the operation, step two, in a manner where they clearly understand why each step is necessary and the key points to look out for is the responsibility of the instructor. Trying out the newbie's performance, step three, so that the instructor validates the understanding and performance of the newbie before they put them on their own. Step four, 
and then ensuring that they get adequately supported before tapering off the coaching is key. For the vast majority of processes, if the newbie doesn't get it, it's likely the process is unclear, too complex, or burdensome, or the instructor has not done steps one to three properly. It's a true case of attack the process, not the person. Failure in this area is a key reason why so many businesses have a problem with churn of new starters who do not stay long in the business while creating a huge burden on the long-term team members who constantly have to support the new starts, causing further reductions in productivity because they aren't actually adding value. It's a great example where pulling the and on and understanding the root causes of the problem really helps. Very often, the problems lie in these areas, poorly documented standards and training processes that stress out the new starts and the existing long-term people alike. Management need to understand this and support a change in approach. The results can be miraculous. So training is evidently key, but it doesn't just end there. So we need to understand how to access standard operating procedures. How team members can access them is so important. How often have we seen work instructions, how-tos or manuals put into a file and then stored away in some drawer or cupboard just to gather dust? Hardly a way for them to live, breathe and be useful standards within an organisation. So no matter the SOP, it's key that the standard is easily accessible at point of use and that all relevant team members know how to access them. SOPs can be made accessible in the following ways. One, they could be printed out and displayed in full. Two, a QR code that can be scanned by a mobile device to display the SOP. This can also be put onto applicable process documentation and automated within an ERP system. Three, a lean Bible where SOPs can be accessed via URL links for reference. Four, they can be accessed via mobile desktop application when they've been generated with specific software like Gambadocs. The appropriate method depends on the application. Incidentally, we designed the Gambadoc software to have a always the latest URL, meaning that if they're kept in a Lean Bible or ERP system, the URL when clicked or the QR code when scanned will always display the latest version of the SOP without the user or administrator needing to do anything else. How cool is that? But let's look at why we would bother doing any of this. Like, why are standard operating procedures important? In the physical book, there is a diagram that shows my now favorite lean quotation of all time, from Taichi Ono, the father of lean. And the quotation is, Without standards, there can be no improvement. So why would Taichi make such a bold proclamation? The graphic shows a slippery slope, and at the bottom is where most companies' processes are, with no standards, no documented processes at all, or just as bad what I call wallpaper standards that aren't kept up to date and that no one is using or following. Still, management divorced from the Gemba get to think they have SOPs in place, when clearly, to any objective view, they do not. It's just sloppy. At the top of the slope is world-class performance, and the process is shown as a ball that gravity wants to pull down that hill. To get the ball up the hill, we see a series of chocks similar to the little wedges used to stop an aircraft wheel from moving. Think backstop. These are standards, which when well implemented, stop the process from falling down the hill into sloppiness again. Kaizen improvement is shown as an upward movement of the backstop, which is accomplished by a process of develop, document, and follow. 
We created the GembaDoc software to reduce the burden of this develop, document, follow process, making it possible to create or edit standard operating procedures within minutes, not hours or days. It really is a game changer, making it possible to create and maintain those backstops that prevent the solid ball of your process from rolling down the quality, cost, and customer experience hill. The next diagram makes that even more clear that standards are literally the foundation of Lean. The schematic is often used to demonstrate the Toyota production system, represented as a house of Lean, with customer satisfaction and business success as the apex of the roof, supported by the pillars of just-in-time, respect for people, or culture, and Jadoka techniques. The foundation of the temple is stability and standardization, with standard operation, standard operating procedures as one of those key principles. When I hold training workshops for Gambadox customers, one of the lines I always use is, you can have all the culture you want, but without stability and standardization, your lean efforts are built on sand. It is that important. Adding an improvement to that chaos is just adding another variation that will likely stay in place for a day or two by just some of the people carrying out the process, then disappear. Lean guru Masaki Imai, founder of the Kaizen Institute, describes this phenomenon better than I ever could. He says, it is impossible to improve any process until it is standardized. If the process is shifting from here to there, then any improvement will just be one more variation that is occasionally used and mostly ignored. One must standardize and thus stabilize the process before any continuous improvement can be made. How often have you or your team made a great change to a process only to come back a few days later to find out that no one is following it. It can be very frustrating. That's why having a clear process of how the standard operating procedures are maintained and documented is key. To finish, let's just summarize the benefits of doing standard operating procedures well. When we talk about the benefits here, we're only talking about them when they're done right. That can only be achieved when the concept is well understood by all stakeholders in the organization and the appropriate tools and resources are allocated to the SOP effort. Number one, a massive source of improvement. Firstly, the initial best of approach becomes the baseline for how process X is done. Secondly, Making process improvements on a solid foundation means they are much more likely to stick than adding another variation to an already unstable process. Number two, reduce stress for team members. There is a clear way of executing all tasks for everyone. Minimize planning hassles caused by absentees or people leaving the business. Well-implemented SOPs also ensure business continuity. Step three, reduce people churn. SOPs provide a consistent basis for training. New starts get adequate support to integrate into the organization with the SOPs as their reference. Number four, process stability. When team members own their already improved process, and that SOP is consistently followed by everyone, it leads to less variation in the process outcome, which can often be measured in terms of quality, cost, or customer experience. Overall, less waste. So if you'd like to learn more about SOPs, the Gambadoc software, and how they can be integrated into your organization culture, feel free to drop me a line on my contact details at the end of the book. Takeaways from Chapter 5 The first, Lean is meant to be flexible. 
Adapt the principles to work for your business. Number two, standards are the foundation of lean. Without them, your efforts are built on sand. And number three, finally, if you really love lean, you will never stop learning. Thanks for listening. This has been Improvement Starts With I, written and narrated by myself, Tom Hughes. To keep in touch, connect with me on LinkedIn or subscribe to my YouTube channel or reach out on my contact details. All of these are contained in the links in the description or in the resources section of the Lean Play app. Best of luck on your lean journey. God bless.